Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Oklahoma. You guys have, uh, talking to you as you came in was sure a pleasure for me as it always is. I, it's gonna be emotional for me, I can tell. I love the people of America. I love this country. And it's so hard to see what's going on right now. I don't know about you, but I get madder and madder and madder when I see things. I'm going to talk about some of those things this morning before we get into the meat of things. We'll have plenty of time for that in the next two days. This seminar is going to be different than any I've ever done. There's not even a freaking whiteboard. Can you believe that? I don't know if I could talk without a pen in my hand, but I'm going to try. Do you want one? No, I don't want one. I, I don't want one. Um, there's going to be some material available for everybody that came on the website that you guys could download for free. And it's... Uh, most of this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. I've had some great help, but before we get started, I want to I want to thank everybody that made this possible putting on all the people that showed up to set up tables and chairs, Ron and Lisa for the food and the coffee and the waters and doing all that shopping and taking that off my hands. What a blessing those two are. They've been uh, generous with their time and their home and their talents, and I appreciate them so much. Katie keeping things rolling in the background with all the hours she spends on the websites, and Tressa for all the work she's done in, on our properties in Texas and keeping them going. And uh, it's just a huge blessing. Miranda for <laughs> so much. She, uh, not only is she a good singer and keeps me entertained, but uh, she has worked so incredibly hard. <clears throat> We're going to have a prayer here in a second. You're on speaker. With me, I just want to invite the Lord's blessings over us all. We all need it, right? Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for this day. I thank you for all the people in this room today. I pray for blessings that are still to protect over them, that you would fill them with the Holy Spirit, that you would station your angels around them and their family members. You see how many are here who are suffering the blight of what's happening in our country and i just pray that they are a bulwark of 
light and that your protection and your shield is constantly upon them. I lift up David to you and I pray for a blessing and a shield over him and that you guard his mind and the words that flow from his mouth come from your throne room on high. I pray for a shield, a blessing, and protection over not only his mind, but his feet, his legs, his back, his shoulders, his hands, his eyes. Dear Lord, we bind and cast out any and all darkness that might want to attack David or these people. We cast them out in Yahshua's name. You tell us in your word, Lord, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you will hear from heaven, you will forgive our sins, and you will heal our land. We love you, Lord, and we claim that promise over our lives. Please make us this day. And grant us the protection we so desperately need. We see that there is a war between good and evil happening all around us. And we claim all the promises of Psalm 91, Lord. That when there are a thousand that will fall at our right hand and 10,000 at our, our side, that nothing will come near us and no plague will come upon our dwelling. And that you grant us and promise us a long life. And dear Lord, I, I lift up this song. Um, um, 146 verse 7 that you will set the prisoner free lord i want to be free to be with my people i want to be constantly working for their benefit and for their blessings please set me free from this prison this trafficking system have mercy on us all we so desperately need you in yeshua's precious holy and awesome name i pray amen Oklahoma. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for calling in. Love you. All right. I'm going to tell you some of the things I'm maddest about right now. For a long time, and if you can remember back in about January, I uh, talked about an intelligence report. I wrote it up on the board and I drew circles around Dallas, Fort Worth. You guys need some? You need some? Go ahead. Here. Here. Go, go to Tressa for scheduling for the quantum bed. You guys want to experience a med bed? That quantum quantum technology. Okay. Also, Doctor Olga is here, and she's got some. Uh, yeah, I'm also doing. I'm I'm scheduling both for Olga's uh, sessions and also for the quantum bed. And I also have a massage uh, chair. So if you all want to have some hands-on healing, um, uh, I'm offering. Um, as well. So um, you can come and schedule with me for the quantum bed. Um, I have a list here for that and then also uh, for uh, Olga's sessions as well. So, and then also for massage, if you like massage, come to me as well. So I just want to let you know that and thank you all so much for being here. None of this would be possible without you. Thank you. All right, back to the circles. In an intelligence report that came out, I think it was December, don't hold me to that. They talked about things that were coming up and what to be scared of. And they've, they've actually tested it out. I don't know if you've known, noticed, but they, they've done these little tests. They shut all the truckers down going to Costco for three days. So for three days, 
They weren't delivering food to Costco or anything to Costco. And they ran a little test on us. How fast would Costco's sh shelves empty without resupplying them? And Costco's shelves just went. <sighs> and then they sent the trucks back and refilled all the shelves. And it's almost like we didn't notice. But they just do these little tests all the time. And government runs these tests to see what's going to happen. And they're getting really good at it. And they use Dallas Fort Worth a lot because it's got that beltway all the way around it. And inside that beltway is 10 million people. So it's pretty easy to compute for them. And they can run these 10 million statistics all day long of what they do. Well, last week, the military ran an exercise of spraying chaff below. So if this is Dallas-Fort Worth, they came in here and they just sprayed chaff and a lot of it to see their excuse was to see if they could create something that looks on the weather map like a storm. And it would show up on the weather map. The wind was blowing to the north through Dallas Fort Worth. And as it got to the other side of the city, it dissipated. They figured out how much to spray that it would carry it just across town. And people saw the residual of it on their lawns. The chaff is heavy and it drops out of the sky. But you can see it on the, on the, uh, on the weather radar map. Well, that heavy chaff is just filled with poison had barium, had aluminum, two of the big ones that they use, but it had sodium fluoride in it. Do you know what sodium fluoride is? Okay, it's a poison. And basically they poisoned everybody in Dallas-Fort Worth. Why? Well, scientists took samples of that and found all the different things that are in it. And it ain't good. There's more in it than that, just those three things. And everybody wonders why our government, our military, is poisoning our own people. Why is it? On, uh, you guys are going to have to bear with me a little bit because I've got a ton to cover this weekend and I've got it spread out. Now, some of you saw that when I was in Tennessee, I made a, a little 15 minute or so video and then another little 10 minute or so video talking about the power structure in America. Everybody see that? Okay. With the who and the stakeholders. Now, something we're running into and uh, thanks to Miranda again, uh, I have read so much material in the last, I don't know, eight months. You guys wouldn't even believe how much I've read. I locked myself away in little cabins here and there, Tennessee and Arkansas, and just read and read and read and read and read and read half the night. I went, went up to Ron's house for 10 days and read and read and read and read every night. He wonders why I have a hard time getting up in the morning. 
because I'm reading while he's sleeping. But I've gone back through and I've pretty much read all the laws in the United States again. All the policy manuals, all the employee manuals of various agencies. I read a whole bunch of the UN crap. And that just makes me ill. And our government right now is essentially a one world government. And, uh, <clears throat> and our military is over here when it should be over here. Okay. And that makes me mad. That's another thing that makes me upset. But this one world government with the stakeholders of the WHO operating under WEF and other things, they have literally pretty much gone to every leader of every nation and said, we hold all the assets. You guys are bankrupt. You're broke. You don't have any money because they hold the bonds to you. They hold the bonds to you. See, here's a funny thing that, and one of the reasons we got to come out of Babylon, come out of this corporate construct, is when a corporation has possession of something, it makes it hard for other corporations to control it. It makes it very hard. We, the people, have to unite. Stop the little petty differences and divisions and crap. And don't believe a lot of the stuff you see on the internet right now. And a lot of the things you hear, don't believe it. The, hey, those guys can cut and paste like nobody's business. They put compilations together. And they do it to divide us. They do it to destroy us, and it does. It does. Some of us aren't strong enough, especially about your third year. Here's what I've noticed over 35 years. That people join this movement, and then they start learning, and they learn and learn and learn and learn and learn, and about the third year, having not done everything that they learned, they don't, they don't get it done. But about the third year, they start going off on tangents. And then they find out, it takes them about a year, finds out that shit doesn't work. And then they work their way back. And sometimes they come back stronger and better, but sometimes their, their pride and their ego are hurt and, and they drop completely away. And that's sad to me. We don't want good people dropping away, okay? We are all in the same foxhole together. You don't argue with the guy beside you in the foxhole. You keep your eye on the enemy and who they are. Heck with that. I can learn from all kinds of different people, right or wrong. They all got something. Nobody is 100% correct on anything. We never have been. We're human. We're never perfect. We're sinners. We sin, we try, we learn, we, we fail, and we, hopefully we learn from our mistakes, we adapt, and we get better, and we keep learning. And I've been doing this 35 years, and I'm still learning. But I keep my mind open, and I keep trying to figure stuff out, and that's what we all got to do. Just continue to unite, not divide. I want that to, to sink in a little bit. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're an American, I love you. Okay. We love you too. This is how close we all are. 
to understanding that our government is criminal. That's it. We're waking up. This world's waking up. Where's my guys from Belgium? Come up here for a minute, would you? Hey, Rob, do you, we have another handheld mic somewhere? Neil? Okay. Run me a handheld mic. Make me nervous. I'm going to make you nervous. <laughs> I put you on the spot. You didn't know it. <laughs> These guys uh, flew here from Belgium. They've flown, they've flown in. They've flown in to see me before in Nashville, spent some days with me. We had a good time. Yeah, too good. <laughs> too good? A lot of driving. It was good. It's a lot of driving for them. They, uh, they come here to America to learn and learn from the, the best people that are teachers and they take it back home and they've gone to uh, the capitals there in Belgium and I'm going to let you just say the, some of the things you guys are doing. What you, what, uh, you got to turn it on. Though. I thought he was going to do his job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, I've got to work already, switch on the mic. <laughs> no, what it is, it's a bit strange, like a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago uh, I owned a restaurant in Belgium. And then they started with the COVID and everything. But I'm going to keep it short because uh, it's, uh, I'm going to let it, the big man speak afterwards. So three years ago, in the middle of the night, I just watched the video of uh, Ron Gibson. And it was three o'clock at my time. So I said, I've got to ring this guy up. So I rang him up the next day because they were shutting down with the police my restaurant because I didn't ask for the QR codes and the vaccination. I'm the only one in Belgium, in Bruges, that did not shut my place down because of the police. They said... So they shut us down for about six months and then I said, this is not right. And as soon as I felt because of the vaccinate, I'm also not vaccinated. So uh, <clears throat> then like I said, I started watching videos because if you sit down for three or four months doing nothing, then you go on the web. I also seen uh, a big man here. And then I got, first of all, I got hold of Ron Gibson. And then we, I just said, I spoke to him, I said, I've got to come and see you. So we made a small trip in 12 days. So we flew from uh, Brussels to, uh, San, uh, to London, London, San Francisco. Then we took the car, drove all the way to Georgia, then drove all the way back down to Las Vegas to see one stupid fuck, Mr. Joe Brandon, for people if you know him. And then we took the flight from Los Angeles through to Tennessee, met this nice man. We spent a couple of days in Tennessee. Then we drove back again to... Uh, Los Angeles and then we flew back all the way to Bruges to Belgium and then we went on the streets in Brussels we took 500,000 people on the streets demonstrating about against our rights and about the sovereignty and it's all it does with this man 500,000 stood up yes. why can't we do it here and uh, we left again, so I said, we, because we're getting into the schedule for the people that don't know, the farmers in Belgium at the moment and France are getting on the streets, they're blocking the streets. There were 1.4 million people in Germany on the roads with the farmers. We got everybody in Belgium now with truckers, as I got loads of videos, but I'm getting blocked. So, uh, because there were all the farmers on the street, Paris is already surrounded. They're ripping up the roads. They're ripping up the roads. The farmers have enough, and now it's up to the people to stand up. I just did a small live over here. I had about a lot of people watching, and everybody, because I'm driving through the night and it's different, we got six hours difference. So uh, that's what people in Belgium are starting to stand up and also with sovereignty and everything else. So don't think you're alone, we're fighting. Even when we get back, we, I drove, uh, we went to Brussels, we got checked by the police when I was waiting outside. We got pulled over in a staircase, we got searched, everything. Then we flew from Brussels to England, we got pulled over again. 
safety, security, because we say, what are you going to do? I says, we're going to get some more information. And not being funny, but the people, the police in Belgium, they're also starting to wake up because they're afraid, because at the end of the day, they also have to pay their bills at the end of the month. And if the farmers come and the police and the army are going to stand up. So that's why we're here, to get as much information when we go back, and then we're not going to stop. So. You want to say anything, Mark? It's just easy, you've got to start preventing, because I was the only one in the restaurant that was outside, and I was the only one that shut my face out. and said, I haven't got the right to ask for your identity or that. I'm not a doctor, so I haven't got the right to, but then they tried shutting me two months again. Without trying to find any of on taxes and everything else, so just keep going. If we go to Brussels, we start with 30. I started off in Brussels with 5,000. Here in America, we sit on our butts inside of our houses. We don't get out. We don't go talk to the people. You get, if you walk into a restaurant here, even even downtown right here, and you start talking to people, it makes a huge difference. You wouldn't believe everybody is awake now. Everybody. They just don't know anybody else is out there. They all go into the same restaurant, 25, 30 separate people. They're all thinking the same damn thing, but nobody's opening their mouth. They're waiting for an answer. They're waiting for some leader to lead them. That ain't, it ain't going to work that way. America has always worked from the bottom up. It doesn't matter what Trump does or doesn't do. I don't even care about who's Democrat or who's Republican. It isn't going to matter when he's the president of the White House Office, Inc., unless he dissolves the corporation. The first thing he's got to do is he's got to kick the U.N. out of the damn country right. and the CDC and the WEF and everybody else. That's what he's got to do. If he ain't doing that, he ain't doing shit. He might as well be Biden. <laughs> I can't keep a straight face on that. <laughs> Anybody in here who are military veterans? Okay, keep your hand up. Any war? Are you against war? Are you for peace? Raise your hands. Okay, keep your hands up. Do you love income taxes or do you hate them? If you hate them, put your hands up if you think they're illegal. They are illegal. Okay. She was a tax attorney. Actual bar member. No. <laughs> Anybody here consider themselves, as it's a duty in this nation, to be one of the militia? Keep your hand up for a second. Are anybody with alternative media and not the regular media? I know you are, Jerry. So put it up. Keep your hand up for a minute. All right. Are you an opponent of open border policies? Okay. Are you a member of a group or a small individual group? that are against things such as animal rights, environmental, or any abortion, put your hands up. Are you with the Patriot Movement? Put your hands up. Okay. According to the Department of Homeland Security, you are an enemy of the United States government, and they have declared you an enemy. And I'm damn proud of and you're an enemy of government. You are considered an enemy of government. You have been since even before the Trading with the Enemy Act. Okay, the Buck Act, the Patriot Act, Obamacare made you an enemy of the government. 
The ATF made you an enemy of the government. The IRS made you an enemy of the government. The Department of Health and Human Services sure the hell has made you an enemy of the government. How many people in here like government? That's right. You're all supposed to raise your hands. We are the government. The people are the government. There is no authority in this country, and I'm going to prove it to you this weekend. There's not one bit of authority in this government except you. None. And just for funsies, I'm going to read this to you. This was an email from Ezra Cohen. You know who Ezra Cohen is? Uh, he did this about a year ago, and I've been saving it for the right moment, and this is it. This was sent to Stephen Hunter, this email. He says, I'm going to spell it out one time only for those are, who are lost and not registering the hundreds of clues that we've been dropping to you. Here we go. One time. Pay close attention. You are watching a movie. A lot of what you are seeing is completely bullshit and fake. I'm, this, I'm quoting those guys. It's so outrageous on purpose just to get your attention. It will continue until it has accomplished that goal and fully accomplish that goal. There is no Biden presidency. And I'm going to tell you something. Biden was caught last week on camera saying Trump was the president of the United States. <laughs> See, because that's not Joseph Biden. You know that, right? Okay. You think they're not working for Trump? They really are. This whole thing is an operation to wake up the people, you guys and your neighbors. And it's going to piss a lot of people off and it's going to hurt a lot of people. But it is absolutely necessary. The real Biden was executed for his crimes long ago. Along with Clinton. That woman in the purple the other day wasn't Hillary Clinton. Yeah. You're seeing actors, and some have masks. That's why Biden keeps referring to himself as the mask president. This means they are the good guys in this movie and on the team of freedom. The entire election was fake. Without Biden becoming president and President Trump, you think he's stepping down, guys? Do you think he did? No, no, no. No, he didn't. Let me tell you an interesting thing that is, most of you probably haven't noticed. I hope you all have in this room, but I'm speaking generally, that the Americans haven't noticed. When President Trump flies somewhere to a rally, yeah. lots of people show up. But when he flies, he flies on Trump Force One, the plane he ordered to replace the new presidential plane. Remember him showing the plane that he ordered? Told how much money it was and what a deal he got on it from Boeing? Remember that? And that's the plane he flies on. He doesn't always fly on the, his own Trump private plane. He flies on Trump Force One. And along with Trump Force One flies a C-135 full of an entire motorcade, full of Secret Service. And he gets out and he drives and there's a long line of cars to where he's going. And Secret Service has been there and checked everything out first because they're the best, most efficient 
security team in the world. And if he has to make a little jaunt, Marine One flies with him. And you'll see three planes in the air. You'll also see two fighter planes. Two F-35s on each side. And that's how Trump goes around this nation. <laughs> you see, and then you got Biden who gets caught in a grocery store <laughs> with the people looking at him. And he, there's not one Secret Service agent in the store. He gets caught walking out of the back side of the White House through the parking lot two security guards not even secret service just security guards w walk halfway with him to his 10 year old car where he gets in by himself because they turned off 200 feet from the car and people were videotaping him are you kidding me you think the president of the united states of america is walking to his own private car without a motorcade and secret service. This whole thing is so damn fake, it's pathetic. When we all wake up to that, that's what the public has to see to wake up. And they're making it more absurd every week. It's getting more absurd. People still believe it. And <laughs> He had a fake inauguration. It wasn't done at the right time. He didn't say the right things, and he only took one of the three oaths. They started up after, after they, well, here, I'll just read this one. As of 15th of December at midnight in 2021, the United States, Inc. was officially bankrupted. The very next day, they started up the White House Office, Inc., a new corporation under the District of Columbia. Bonnie, Bonnie in prison and me here have been studying the laws of the District of Columbia, and we've read every one. And I'll tell you some of the things we've learned. It's absolutely amazing. The amazing thing is even the U.S. Inc. had no power. Since this country has been a corporation, especially since 1871, all the way back to the District of Columbia's formation in 1871, and this country became a corporation, the president's office has had no power as the corporation other than to direct the employees of the corporation. They've had no power. They just got you to consent to be an employee. They've had no power to do anything, no power to form laws. This is why a bill on Capitol Hill, that old cartoon that teaches us as children how laws are passed in this country was a farce. They left out a big part. And that big part is that once a bill is written by the lawyers on K Street based upon how much lobbying dollars they got. It goes to Congress to be passed, and then it goes to the Senate to be ratified, and then it goes to the President to be signed into law. <coughs> Baloney. It goes from the President's desk after his okay to the mayor of the District of Columbia. And if he don't like it, it goes back to Congress to be rewritten. And who controlled that corporation? Well, it used to be the Crown and ultimately the Vatican through several little steps. All subsidiary corporations. Well, then the Vatican went away and the City of London went away and the Crown Inc. went away and what's left? The District of Columbia ran by the stakeholders of the who? 
controlling through the United Nations all of the health of the chattel property, which is you. And through that, through the Department of Health and Human Services, they hold the bond paper of about a hundred billion dollars each. It's crazy. Well, Judge Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, said as of December 15th, midnight 2021, U.S. Inc. was officially bankrupt and according to the Supreme Court, no longer existed. Thus reversing the 1871 Act of England and allowing the U.S. to go from maritime law to common law. That's a big deal. It's a very big deal. I'm going to jump back to 1983 for just a minute. Because we're talking about, for a short period of time this morning, very short, I'm not going to go into it very much, this one world government we're under that none of us wanted, that really only exists on paper, not in our minds and hearts, right? Right. Okay. Public Law 98 166, under 97 Stat 1096. November 28th, 1983. That's how long ago this was. The principle or doctrine of one world government or one world citizenship for the promotion, direct or indirect, of the principle of the doctrines of the one world government or one world citizenship in section 302, funds are appropriated under this title shall be available for expenses of international arbitrations and other proceedings for the international resolution of disputes arising under treaties or other international agreements including international air transport agreements and arbitrations arising under contracts authorized by law for the performance of services or acquisition of property abroad this cool guy that was in my Oregon group for a long, long time and is pretty much running things over there now. He's six foot seven, skinny as a rail. He's young, and his name is Jared. He just told me the other day that a Chinese Communist Party bought 33,000 acres of Oregon right behind his house. You think that's the only place? <clears throat> he wants to know how he can shut them down. That's what he called me for. It's so interesting to me how long this is all has been developing and how long it's been going on. And we've all been sleeping. Watching the movie. No, they, what they did is got us, just like the Romans, they got us busy with games. Have you ever seen or looked on Google Earth or seen uh, memes posted of football stadiums around the country taken straight down from the air? Do you know they all look like an all seeing eye? See, that's the kind of stuff that pisses me off. They put it right in plain sight. You look down upon Google Earth onto our federal courthouses, especially all the new ones, and what do they look like? Big ships. Big ships at docks. The one in South Miami, even the grass is waves. Pisses me off. They put it right in our face. Do you like it when somebody chastises you and they just, they just throw the shit right in your face? Doesn't it make you mad? I can barely contain myself. 
I don't know about you or how you're feeling, but I'm about ready to drive a fucking tractor somewhere pulling some manure. <laughs> I don't like to cuss, but I, I'm looking at Spain and Italy and France and Germany and Netherlands and England even. I'm looking at Australia and some of the stuff they're doing over there. And Ireland will kick their butts. Those little suckers are tough. <laughs> And they ain't afraid of nothing. See, that's a problem. Have you noticed how many police officers are around? Can you drive 100 miles through Oklahoma without seeing 20 of them? Well, let me tell you something. There's this lady who's a prisoner in, uh, in with Bonnie. And I've talked to hundreds of these women. She started to blow the whistle. She was a bookkeeper, treasurer, or something like that in her county. And she started was starting to blow the whistle on the mayor and some of the commissioners and police chief and a few others for what they were doing with the funds that she was seeing. And you know what they did to her? They came after her prosecutor, throw her in jail for theft of money in her county. And she tells me on the phone, she goes, I'm the only damn person in the county who wasn't stealing anything. <laughs> and they crucified her for it. And they put her in jail. And here's what she told me. She goes, my, my daughter just called me the other day. My daughter's 27 years old, lives in Oklahoma, and she thought she couldn't get a job that wasn't like 10 bucks an hour. She had been trying for a year. She'd been working for eight or 10 years since she was about 18, and she couldn't seem to get over that $10 low wage hump, right? Whatever it was, doesn't matter what the number was. Low wage hump, and she couldn't get over it. So she saw an ad in the, to become an Oklahoma State Patrol officer. No degree in criminal science, no degree in anything related to justice in some way. And she goes down and knocks on the door at the State Patrol office and she fills out an employee application. And to her surprise, she got hired. She never thought she'd get the job. She got hired. And 35000 a year starting salary for no, someone with no experience is a lot better than 10 bucks an hour. So she accepted the position. Showing up for her first day on the job, she's thinking, Okay, I'm going to show up. I'm going to get sworn in, like they told me. Probably go to HR and fill out all my paperwork, get my uniform and stuff, and then go through training. That they're going to put me through, you know, six or eight months of training to become a police officer. She shows up on day one. She sits in a meeting of police officers some of them just like her, brand new, after she was filled out her paperwork at HR and was issued a, a badge and a gun and a uniform and sat in the meeting and they handed her a set of keys to a patrol car and a ticket book and said, go write tickets. Academy. Nothing. <laughs> she goes, Mom, I don't have any firearms trained. I'm wearing a gun. <laughs> I'm driving a car. I'm out there stopping speeders. What happens if one pulls a gun on me? She's scared to death. 
Well, let me tell you something. You know what happens when you're standing in a foxhole and you got a guy there scared to death? You're worried about getting shot by him. What about the one she stops? What if one moves wrong? She don't have the training to decipher the difference. Now, I don't know. That might worry you guys on the way home. <laughs> but it does me. And they're just hiring them. You know why they're hiring them? Because they're expendable backup. They know we're rising up, the people. We got to do it peacefully as possible. Because these stupid guys will shoot you. They'll kill you on the side of the road. And one of these people that you try and expose might put a hit out on you. No, I'm not here to frighten you. You ought to be frightened no matter who you are. I don't care if you're the teenage person sitting at home on the television set. You ought to be afraid to drive in this country right now. Or travel. I'm telling you this for a reason. Is this going to get a lot worse before it gets better? You got to be prepared. There's sometimes things more important than doing all your paperwork. Now, that's important, too, because that's what sh tells them we're standing up, even if it's wrong, even if they don't accept it and they return it. Somebody's reading it and it's making a difference by the millions of people. This paper has been our tractors. The 40 million AORs that the State Department's got. You know how much paper that is? Can you imagine stacking up 40 million? 50 pages deep or 30 pages deep or 20 pages deep or whatever it is. How big a pile of paper that is? They got to do something with it. That makes a huge statement, guys, bigger than anything else. And these idiots that are telling you the AOR is not important, it's the single most important thing. Ron, you want to come here for a minute? Can I put you on the spot? Tell you what happened back in March or something like that? You know what I'm talking about. Forty million. We on? Yeah. Yep, Rob. Just do test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. You got his mic? We're good. Okay. All right. I wasn't prepared for this. So no. To forgive me. Hi. Um, so Lisa and I, my wife, we did our AORs in February. I think it was the end of February last year. And um, I've got a relative in Oregon who's a state cop. And I asked him to run my passport, my driver's license. And I think it was he's it, because he's a state police. well you hadn't even had your pass got your state yeah. national pass well no but i did this in august wrong okay. or oh, kind of november so anyway he uh he did run my report and because he's a state cop it was a uh, ncic report which is the fbi database and it came back on there that name changed uh march 10th 23 and i thought Hmm. The only thing that we had done by March 10th of 23 was submit our AOR, and we hadn't even got the information back on that by that point, and we hadn't even got our passport. We didn't get our passports until the end of March. So I thought they keyed in my AOR, the Secretary of State, as a name change. Now, I did get my name changed through Josephine County Courts in Oregon, but I did not get that done until I think it was August of 23. So that was interesting to me. So we, uh, 
we did get uh, we did get our names changed from the all capital letter to the upper and lower proper case. And I'll tell you a little story about that too. If I forget where I'm going, <laughs> help me out. Uh, I'm trying to take this lion's mane mushroom to help my memory, but I can't seem to remember where I left the lion's mane mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, I'll talk about the name change and tell you a little story about that. But we had an interesting uh, seminar, I guess, at our house. We've had a couple of them. Uh, Kiki came and put on some name, same, name change seminars. And uh, we had one interesting one that uh, David was at. And we had a meeting in our office, and it was David and Kiki and one other guy. I can't remember his name short guy, big loud voice. I don't know, we'll just refer to him as no name, uh, or no body, no body, because no body is that all capital letter vessel, and he's tried to get his name changed several times, but can't seem to get that done. So he's telling everybody now that the name change is not important, and don't bother going down that road. So, uh, I had got a jury duty thumpings in the mail in Oregon. We're actually from Arkansas, but still registered to vote or had been. And I think that jury duty summons was for November 14th, and I happened to be out there in Oregon at that time. So I took it down to the courthouse, and I went to the window, and I told the clerk, I said, I received this piece of mail, um, but it's not addressed to me. And she uh, looked at that and she says, uh, are you not this person, Ronald Lee Croom? And I said, well, I'm not that Ronald Lee Croom. I said, I have a name change order from a judge here at Justin County Courthouse mm -hmm. and uh, changing my name from the all capital letter to the upper and lower proper name. And that was all I said. I didn't, nothing was said about citizenship. And she looks at me and she says, are you telling me you're not a U.S. citizen? Now, she knew because I never said anything about citizenship. And I said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. And she says, well, what are you? I said, well, I'm an American. I said, uh, I'm a state national. She says, uh, do you have any documentation to substantiate that? And I said, yes. I said, uh, I said, I have my affidavit of repudiation here from the Secretary of State of the United States. And I said, I also have a e-verify document from Homeland Security that with a, or not from Homeland Security, but with a Homeland Security watermark stating that I am a non-U.S. citizen eligible to hire. She said, I'd like to see that one. So I handed that to her. I could watch her. She walked to the back. She said, I'll be right back. And she approached a guy at a desk, I'm assuming was possibly her supervisor. And he received the document, looked at it, and they talked, and he handed it back to her, and she walked back up to me, and she said, uh, she says, sir, your name will be removed from our list, and you won't be contacted again. Handed it back. So I can tell you from what I've seen on my NCIC report that the affidavit of repudiation is very valuable. Yes. So. Thanks. Thank Ron and Lisa again for all the coffee and snacks. So. There are certain things we we really need to do, and uh, I redid the ten steps because that was for classes one, two, and three. You guys are past that now. Most of the world's past that now. Not everybody's done it, done the paperwork, but in your thinking, in your mind, most of the world's past that now. We're recognizing that things are corrupt, things need to change, we need to change with them, and we're 
trying to be the Americans that we were meant to be. 90% of everything we do comes from here, comes from our heart. What we believe and the words that come out of our mouth in those speaking those beliefs is the most important thing. It's more important than all the damn paperwork. The reason we have to do paperwork, and believe me, I wish we didn't have to do any. But the reason we have to is because of the slave system we've been under. And all the contractual agreements that we've mistakenly done our entire life. And these contractual agreements, when, who own, owns a company? When you have a company and you have a contract with somebody, you got to fulfill the contract, right? Uh, or it's a breach of contract, right? We've been contracting our whole lives. Some of us are older. I'm 60. Six decades I've been alive. Contracting constantly. What's that? The Correct. The fraud has got to be proven. We consent through acquiescence. We don't say anything. They come after us and we don't think it's important. So we consent. We give our consent in a million different ways and we have to constantly think about that consent and how do we reverse that consent? That's how government takes control of us. And believe me, it's in their darn little computers. And you can walk into a courtroom and you can, you can tell them, no, 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 I'm here by special appearance. I'm challenging jurisdiction and standing. I'm, I'm a man. <laughs> you can do all these different things and get rung through the ringer because you didn't prove it. And that's a problem. It's a real problem. And since April 10th, when Bonnie was arrested in court on a different thing, they got her into the courthouse to be arrested voluntarily on something else and then said, oh, we don't have jurisdiction over that matter right now. We can't hold court and then arrested her on something else without a warrant and told her in the courtroom that she didn't, they didn't have a warrant. And then they tried to make up a warrant. We caught them at it. We caught them in the lie. So they removed that really quick afterwards. And then they went back and they to an old warrant that she had had from years ago and changed the date on it. After the fact, after the police who were put her in handcuffs said, we don't have a warrant. She never got due process. You know, what's funny. <laughs> I did our name change. I did Bonnie's name change and I submitted that all with her DNA to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Executive Director's Office and had him served. Two days later, she's paroled. She got paroled two days later. They still got her. Don't worry about it. They got her. Same bed she was in. But now she's officially a parolee and not a prisoner. They're just not going to let her go. There's a reason they're not going to let her go, but we'll go into that later. We beat her, beat them over and over and over again. They arrested her under a all capital letter name that was her former name from an old charge that had been discharged that she had already served time on that wasn't a charge at all legally wasn't a charge and they admit it wasn't a legal charge the parole board admitted everything with bonnie everything they admitted she never should have been arrested in the first place. 
They admitted her trial was a sham. She never got due process. They admitted that she never had a parole contract and was on parole. So how does she violate a parole when she never had a contract to violate? The Texas Board of Paroles admitted everything to Bonnie in her parole hearing. Everything. They admitted that her case was discharged and that it was changed to dismiss so they could bring it back up again. You can't just change it. It was discharged. That means the debt was discharged. And they changed it to dismiss and brought it back up again. And they tried her again, and she did a fabulous job in court. Oh, my gosh. They charged her with 33 counts of parole by violations, and she won all but seven. But it only takes one, and they can throw you back in jail. And that's what they did. See? And then they admitted they shouldn't have thrown her in jail the second time. And then we did some paperwork, and in about three months, she was released. Her case was abated. You, you all know the definition of an abatement? It means to void from the beginning. So the Tenth Court of Appeals abated her case. And Johnson County held a hearing to try and get her on five things, and she beat it. And the next morning, she was released from jail. They came and they fed her breakfast at 4.30 in the morning. At 5.15, they handed her plain white clothes, told her to change out of her stripes. At 5.45, they came and got her, walked her over to the desk where she signed out and was released. Then they walked her to the door to the parking lot, not the transport room, the parking lot and shoved her out the door. She walked a few feet on the sidewalk and a police officer said, turn around. He put her in handcuffs. He put her in the back of his car. He drove four hours at 96 miles an hour so he could make it down there and back in one shift. And he put her in a different jail four hours away. And the county marked her as released, and the state marked her as in an off-site medical facility to try and hide her from us. And they hid her from us for two and a half days. And I called every hospital in Texas in two days. Got my team of intelligence guys on it, and within 10, 12 hours, they found her. I called the prison down there. Yeah, she's here. I said, what name are they holding her under? And they had changed her name. Now, see, in the Tenth Court of Appeals, to back up a little bit, if you read the documents, the transcript documents, it says, Bonnie Allen Thomas versus State of Texas, all caps. And then it says, also appearing, Bonnie Allen Peroni, Bonnie Ruth Allen, Bonnie this, Bonnie that. Five different names, six different people appeared in court under Bonnie's body. Her name spelled six different ways. And I went, oh, holy shit. And I go over to Ron's house and we're talking about name change before Kiki even got there. And we decided we were going to change mine and Bonnie's name because she can have so many. Right. And Lisa gets on the computer and populates out Bonnie's name and comes up with 10 pages, three columns, about 75 per names per column. 10 pages, that's 750 variations of her name. And I took that and I sat down and I go, my gosh, I'll be here until, uh, I don't know, 150 years. I can win about, it takes me about three months to beat them. And in three months, if I work through her names, I'll be here a couple of lifetimes trying to get a release from prison until I beat them on every single name. 
So we changed her name and we changed it to one name. We took all those names and we changed them all to one name through a court order, an exemplified court order with three seals on it. And then I tied her foot fingerprints, her hair, her nails, her DNA to the name change. I tied my DNA to the name change too. And when I told Ron and Lisa that, that I want, didn't want to change my name unless I could do that, I think they might have freaked out a little bit. <laughs> Wondering if I'd get approved. <laughs> But uh, I decided I wasn't going to change my name if I couldn't tie my DNA to my name. So I tied my DNA all the way back in my haplo and uh, my paternal and my maternal haplo all the way back to Adam and Eve. Just 6,000 years back. And I tied my DNA to my name. Because that's what they do, guys. So the people that are doing their name changes out there, if you're not tying your DNA to it, you better. You better get it done because Bonnie's body is held as the surety to whatever name they wanted to use. And literally, I'll bet you if they ran out of her name, they'd call her Marcy Smith and hold her body to it. All they've got to do is take her fingerprints and write Marcy Smith's name and tie her body to the name and go bond it. So they don't give a shit what your name is until you can only be identified as one name. You know, they did the same thing to me. Do you know the same day they arrested Bonnie, they arrested me? Most of you know that. How long did they hold me? What did they do after they let me loose? They wiped me out of their computer system. See, what they found out really quick is that my name was trademarked. That, that name they couldn't use. They couldn't create a bond on it. They made me pay the little bonds. You know, those little bonds are tickets. They're tip money. It's like going into a restaurant. It ain't the meal. It's the tip. OK, you got to understand that. Traffic tickets are the same thing. You know, you get stopped in a traffic ticket. That police officer creates a cause of action. That cause of action creates a case. They take you out of it. That is attached to a CUSIP, which is attached to a bond, usually about $10,000 bond. And you pay $197 for the traffic ticket. That's the tip money on the 10000 that they made because they stopped you on the side of the road. You think that ticket money even pays the gas in their car? No. This shit don't fund government. It's tip money. Those little fines they charge you guys on a million different things is tip money. It doesn't fund government. Taxes don't fund government. All the income taxes you've ever paid, not one dime of it, has gone to the federal government. That's a joke. It goes to the interest on the bankruptcies of this nation. That's it. President Trump says, quit funding the cabal. He told you to stop paying those taxes. Now, some taxes are right. Some are wrong. I don't mind paying taxes that are right. We asked this government to provide us with 19 essential governmental services and no more. And I don't mind paying my share of that. But when they're giving you 6,000 services or more, and they're forcing you at gunpoint to pay for them, it's time to stop. Yeah. This is a Federal Reserve note. 
A Federal Reserve note is a? It's a debt. It's a debenture. How do you pay tax on a debt? Is it, isn't this what you're getting for your wages? You're getting a debt, and that's why it's called the national debt. Every time they hand one of these out to you, you're contributing to the national debt. And you're paying taxes on a debt? We got to change our thinking. So I walk into my banker and I say, I want to make a deposit. He says, how much do you want to deposit? I said, nothing. I want to make a deposit. So when you make a deposit in a bank, this is energy. That's all it is. It's energy. Energy creates movement. If this does not discharge a debt, doesn't pay a debt. You can't pay a debt with a debt. The debts are keeping track of. I knew there'd be one soon. <laughs> you can't pay a debt with a debt. When energy stops moving, it's put into the bank and it stops moving. It should be shown as a negative in your account. And it should show a positive coming out to pay and discharge the debt. When you make a deposit in your bank account, like from your trust, it shows up as a negative in your bank. And when it goes out, it shows as a positive. See, they've screwed you up this whole time in your thinking. Energy stops moving. It's not expending any energy. It's negative. It's not doing nothing. It's grounded. It's negative. When it goes to pay a debt and it's moving, it's positive. It's what starts the car. Yes. When we start waking up to that, your world will seriously change. People are getting their homes foreclosed on. How many people in this room have had their home foreclosure? <laughs> yeah, that's quite a few. I counted thousands. I think I was almost at 30. Well, less than 300 in here, 30. It's what? 10%? One out of every 10 home, gone. Was the note with the signature? If it wasn't, it was fraud. Supreme Court's ruled on that. Go get the house back. Be careful about injuring someone else. Go get the value of the house back and go buy a new house. Don't injure somebody else. The United States Code, I've been telling you for 30 years to make it your friend. Make it your friend. It's just a code. It's a statute. It's not law. It's not even positive law, is it? <laughs> She's an attorney. You understand it's not law. She is on a mission to destroy Title 18. <laughs> It's not law, and the government's using it against the people because they're employees of government, and it can only be used against government. It's an employee manual. The United States Code is an employee manual. But the reason I tell you to use it and learn it and make it your friend is because you can use their employee manual against the corporate employees, <clears throat> right? But it's only prima facie evidence of law. It's not law. The statute at large is law. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, and believe me, I love the people who are out there trying to teach state national stuff. Name changes, anything. I, uh, whether it's land patents or name changes or any little part of aspect of our stuff that I've been teaching it for 35 years. If you want to go teach it, go teach it. I don't care what you pick. Ron Gibson in 2009 became a friend of mine and I love him for choosing land patents and becoming an expert on that and writing a book about it and be, it will be a qualified federal witness on the subject. Okay, I love him for that. Any aspect of what we do, you go out and teach it, I love you for it. I'm telling you that. People that are doing the name change stuff right now, I love them for it. But if they're teaching it and they don't understand jurisdiction, land, air, and water, and they don't understand our court systems and how they work, and they don't understand the importance of tying your body, your surety to the name, then they might be doing a disservice in some way. But at least they're getting people on the right path. They're moving them forward. Right or wrong, 80% right, 50% right. If you're 51% right, thank you. <laughs> Fifty-one percent. We're improving this country. Trying to do better. Keep striving for a hundred. We'll never get a hundred percent. I ain't a hundred percent. I hope to hell I'm eighty-five. Just do it. Go wake up a country. Stand. Get the tractors together. The truckers, you see the truckers going to the Texas border? Yes. Let me tell you what a bullshit political event that is. It's another thing that makes me mad. I appreciate the truckers and the militia getting them riled up and getting them to go do something and get off the couch. I appreciate that very much. I really do. Bridge to bridge, Eagle Pass. All the military's there, everybody's there, the politicians show up there, the presidents show up there, everybody shows up there, and you drive a half mile down the road and there's an open freaking gate with a road you can drive into Mexico with. You won't even talk to anybody. Just drive on in. Or drive on back. Every half a mile. On and on and on, they put holes in the freaking gate. In the fence. Why put up a fence? Is there? I was a cattle farmer. A cow will find the hole in the fence. I had a ranch, ranch that was nine miles of fence line to get around it. And it was uphill and downhill. And you had to ride it on horseback because the terrain was rough. And I don't know if you've ridden nine miles on horseback and in one day to check fences, uphills and downhills, and over around trees and rocks and over terrain and down through creek bottoms, and it's a lot of work and your ass gets sore. <laughs> but you only gotta drive on the flat road a half a mile and you can drive right into Mexico. And 13 million people have come across the border. Thirteen million. Mostly military age men. See, our US military last year was short in their uh, their recruitment numbers. They can't recruit any of our farm boys anymore because they're waking up. And they don't want to go to war for oil or politics or money. They don't want to go bomb some other country that we got nothing to do with. They're not on our Texas border or Arizona border or California border or even our New Mexico border. They ain't there. And I'm not saying they shouldn't all be there. 
I'm saying put up a solid damn fence nobody can get through with a gate and let them in one at a time and see if they're righteous. But what our government did is they went to China They went to the Middle East. One more time, I take it away from you. <laughs> they went to the Middle East. They went to other countries and they put up posters because our numbers were down 40,000 per branch of service last year in recruitment numbers per branch of service. How do we maintain a strong military if nobody's joining? We're not joining, and I understand that because we're not fighting for the right things. So don't join. We haven't had an honest war in this country since World War II. Not one. It's all been United Nations authorized conflicts. Not one war declared by Congress since World War II. Everything uh, we've fought for is bullshit. And we're all getting tired of it. We're all waking up to it. And that's, uh, it hurts me. I love this nation. I love its people. And it hurts. And it hurts bad. And I'm ready to take out the son of a bitches that are causing it. I'm all for buying rope and, and lead. But the problem is we got to spend the ink first. We keep spending the ink and the paper. We got to fight as peacefully as possible before we can't. And we'll know when. We'll not only know when, we'll be told when. Until then, we be peaceful. God, that's hard for me. I just want to go down there and these evil guys that are putting my people in prison, and my wife in prison, trying to put me in prison, pisses me off a little bit. <laughs> the only reason they're corruption in our government right now is because we didn't drag them through the streets. That's it. It's the only reason. Which brings me to the sheriff's handout. So you got uh, some books down here that some of our great people have put together to hand to your police officers and sheriffs. Yeah. That might just change their minds and some of the sheriffs in this country are on our side and they're good people we had a police chief that was going to be here today he's been to three maybe four seminars i love that man and he couldn't make it today unfortunately he had to decide <laughs> and near the last minute these are available for purchase. How much? That was that was free. That one's free. Donation. Okay, this one's free. The nice one's thirty bucks. The nice ones are thirty bucks. Trust me. If you guys come up here and take these for free, you ought to be whipping your own ass on the way out. <laughs> because I'm telling you, I know some people don't have money, and that's okay. Come get it for free. But the time, energy, paper, commitment it took to put these together is expensive. I had some of the pages that I'm going to be teaching here this weekend. I went to a print shop, see how much it costs to copy it for you all. And I want that's a car <laughs> to print it and staple it. Colored copies for this many people is a car. So what we did, did is we digitized it. It's going up on the website, and you guys will get a code 
be told the code before the weekend's over where you can download it for free. I'll give it to you. Yeah, if you're not going to give it to the sheriffs, don't take it. It ain't for you. You guys are awake. Go wake up a police officer with it. A son, a grandson, a son-in-law. Some of you probably have family or friends that are in the sheriff's department or a police officer. That's who you give it to. Can we get to the link to add to yours that they can download it Yes, Katie. Go see Katie. Tell her I said she's busy out there somewhere. So. Can they get one and make lots of copies and hand them out? Yes. Yes. There you go. Okay, these guys worked hard to put that together. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I love my people who take the initiative and do something. Okay. If we all did something, this country would be a different place. Okay. 22, United States Code, Section 71001. 7101. You guys, please read this. 22, U.S. Code, Section 7101. Purposes and Findings. The purpose of this chapter to combat trafficking in persons. Predominantly women and children. It talks a little bit about slavery. It talks a, a little bit about other things, but it says the degrading inst I'm not reading the whole thing. <laughs> the degrading institution of slavery continues throughout the world. Trafficking in persons is a modern form of slavery and is the largest manifestation of slavery today with over 700,000 persons annually back when this was done, which was a long time ago. But I'm going to tell you, that's a lie. It ain't 700,000. It's 7 billion. Because everybody's a slave. Everybody. Everybody is being trafficked. That's why they call it traffic. That's why they call the police car a cruiser. That's why it has blue lights on top, because it's in the water. It's in Admiralty. Remember when the cop car said law enforcement, they had red lights? Yeah. And they changed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Maybe <clears throat> they were supposed to be law enforcement, protect and serve. They're not anymore. Their policy enforcement it says policy right on their on their uniform. It says on the side of their car. What do you think the word police is? Police put a piping over its policy. Their policy enforcement. They all work for private for profit corporations acting and pretending to be government under color of law, which is a fallacy. It's SMU. Yes. You making it cooler in here? Thank you. <laughs> Some of you might want to hug me on the way out too, and I don't think you'd want to after doing this. Trafficking in person is not limited to slave or sex industry. It's not. It's not limited to children. It's not limited to women. It's boys and full grown men and of all ages. Traffickers often make representations to their victims that physical harm may occur to them or others should the victim escape or attempt to escape. Gosh, that sounds like a cop and a jail guard. Yeah. 
Trafficking in persons is increasingly perpetrated by organized, sophisticated, criminal enterprises, such as the courts. Such trafficking is the fastest growing source of profits for organized criminal enterprises. Profits from the trafficking industry contribute to the expansion of organized crime in the United States. Trafficking is in persons. Trafficking in persons is often aided by official corruption in counties of origin, transit, destination, threatening the rule of law under the color of law, by the color of law. Trafficking involves violations of other laws, including labor. Do you know you have a contract with your employer? Do you know government can't interfere in the obligation contracts? That means it can't arrest you. You're supposed to be at work. Now I'm going to get into this more in depth. It's, there are laws against kidnapping, slavery, false imprisonment, assault, battery, pandering, fraud, extortion. You know how much they've extorted me since April? I don't even want to throw out the number. It'll scare the hell out of you, but it's more than one and a half million dollars. <laughs> Trafficking in person substantially affects interstate and foreign commerce. Of course it does. It affects your job. Let me ask you a question, Jerry. If a police officer picks you up for running a red light and he sees something in your car he doesn't like and he arrests you and he takes you and he impounds your car and he puts you in jail and you're waiting trial and that trial let's just say takes three months that's pretty fast sometimes i know guys have been there two years waiting trial in jail waiting. yes in jail waiting and you had car payments on that car it's gone. What happens if you're working for somebody else and you miss three months of work? They hire somebody else. What happens if you miss three months of house payments? It's gone. And then you're found innocent, Gary, and you get to go home. Thank you very much. Get out the door. Well, they created some bonds on you and profited from you. I have talked to hundreds of women in prison since Bonnie's been in there. She, she teaches church on Saturday while well, she's in there. Bible study every night. Okay. She's on a mission. And she's gone to other countries on missions before. And she says, this is no different. Your lives are destroyed by fraud. There can be no home foreclosures in this country. Every one of them is done through fraud. That's one out of 10 in this room. Your homes were taken away through fraud. Trafficking for purposes such as involuntary servitude. That means they put handcuffs on you and put you in prison. You didn't volunteer for that crap, did you? 
I just didn't walk up and say, hey, put those on me. I, I, I want to go with you. <laughs> Trafficking for peonage. You guys all know what peonage is? I just look it up. You should know. And other forms of forced labor. Do you understand the state capital of Texas was built off the backs of young black and brown men because they could handle the hot Texas sun better and work in the quarries to mine that pink rock that they built the Capitol building with. And most of those inmates were there for vagrancy. A young man would be walking down the street on the way to his grandma's house to deliver a quarter milk and he'd get stopped for vagrancy. They would try him, they'd put him in prison, put him in. That's where the mining quarry is in Austin, Prisoner Hill. Does that make you proud? to be an American. Trafficking includes all elements of crime by means of fraud, force, or coercion. False imprisonment, assault, battery, pandering, fraud, extortion. Trafficking in persons substantially affects interstate foreign commerce. Trafficking for such purposes as involuntary servitude, peonage, and other forms of forced labor has an impact on the nationwide employment network and our labor. And there's a United States code on that that they can't target individuals. I got a call yesterday that made me cry from a family in Idaho who has been imprisoned in their house now for 90 days. And if any one of them leaves their house, they're arrested. The cops are sitting around town waiting for them to leave. And every time they leave, they're harassing and arresting that family because of their last name. and have been told if they leave their house, they're gonna be arrested and thrown in prison. So now they're more scared as of yesterday. Yesterday they were told that they will be thrown in prison and not let out if they leave their home. Up till now, they've just been giving them traffic tickets and various things, just harassment. And that's a county in Idaho. Idaho, a conservative state, all Republican. Texas is pretty much all Republican. Conservative state, Oklahoma, 20 cops a mile. Conservative state, all Republican. The only state where every county was Republican. Our Republican states are harder, the court system's harder on the people in Republican states than they are in the liberal Democrat states. Liberal, liberal, liberal Democrat states, they find them, let them out. They don't care. Republican states love the, the blue line. They support the police. They support courts and justice and it's the very people that are oppressing them it's just like this what is this it's a war flag we fly that uh, over our house and we designate our house as a military installation and we allow them to come in for quartering the constitution says no military quartering right but if we fly that flag, now it's a military installation. It's a fort. 
and they're free to come in your house and eat your food, take what they would need during times of war. You better have one of these flying in front of your house. And then the military can't come in, and they know that. Now, I don't mind supporting our military boys because they think they're fighting for the right reasons, but I'm going to talk them out of it pretty soon if they come into my house. I support our military veterans. Have my whole life. <clears throat> but they don't even know what they're fighting for. I support our patriots, but they don't know what they're patriotic to. They don't know their government. They don't know their laws. This is the stuff that hurts me and it makes my blood boil. In the United States, the seriousness of this crime and its components is reflected in current sentencing guidelines, resulting in weak penalties for convicted traffickers. All these judges that are try believe me, we got one case alone in a state right next to here, Missouri, where in one case we are we went through thirteen judges. Two years. We removed 13 judges from the bench. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They get a slap on the wrist. You got a man that was just sentenced. Maximum term he could be sentenced for. He knew exactly what to say in the courtroom. He knew exactly what to do. We had already heard through the grapevine that his case was going to be dismissed. And his whole entire family, his children, his grandchildren, got threatened by police in the elevator on the way to court. And he apologized to everybody for making a mistake and admitted to the crime where he wasn't guilty and he was sentenced to maximum penalty to save his children and his grandchildren from being hassled by the police and the courts and the judges. He sacrificed himself. And believe me, he had that thing won. And he's a good man. It's a little loud mouth sometimes, but I love him. And he was a good man, and he was honest, and he was righteous. So, in some countries, enforcement against traffickers is hindered by official indifference, by corruption, and even by officials in government participating in the trafficking. Because victims of trafficking are unfamiliar with laws, cultures, and languages. I found that interesting. See, English language is a real problem in America. It's the language of Babel. I wrote this really good legal document. Man, I sat there and I went through and I perfected it and, and read it. And I even had a retired judge helped me write it. And I took the advice of one of our fellow state nationals and we put it in a translate program and we translated from the English we wrote it in into Latin, translated it into Hebrew, and then we translated it back into English and then we read the document. And I went, holy shit, I know why our people are in jail. Mm -hmm. Boy, 
we admitted to being in their jurisdiction. We admitted to our standing. We had, we consented to everything because we don't know the English language. We haven't been taught the English language. Our kids aren't being taught it for sure. And our English language is awful, by the way. One of the founding documents of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, recognizes the inherent dignity and worth of all people. It states that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The right to be free from slavery and involuntary servitude is among those rights. Acknowledging this fact, the United States outlawed slavery and involuntary servitude in 1865, recognizing them as evil institutions that must be abolished, abhorrent to the principles upon which the United States was founded. And then they created the 13th Amendment to the Constitution and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And they made all of you slaves. We've got to understand what we're up against. And that is bigger than we even thought. You know, I moved to Texas thinking Texas would be a good place to be, that it was very conservative, that we loved our guns down there. And, and uh, it didn't take very long. Within 30 days, I saw the corruption in the county and how bad it was. You could tell every time you drove down a county road. Want to tell you some of the things to look for? Yeah. They're dogs, just randomly run them in the streets. Don't have any homes, don't know where to go. So they're trash all up and down the side of the streets. How's the pavement? Our dirt roads in the liberal state of Oregon are better than the paved roads in Texas. I can show you paved roads in Texas in the county that are all county roads where there's 20 inches of difference in the pavement across the width of the street. 20 inches. Take a 20 foot straight two by four, lay it across there, put a level on it and then measure. Worst roads I've ever seen. Don't. Texans pay the same tax at the gas pump that the rest of the world does? They do. And the fact they produce more gas, more oil, have more cars, have a better economy. If they were a country all by themselves, they'd be the sixth largest economy in the world. They're a rich, rich, rich state. And they can't pave the roads. Because some judge is building his house with the gas tax money. I'm telling you, the corruption is incredible down there. The biggest crook is the county treasurer, commingling funds amongst two or three hundred corporations in the county. If we did that as business people, we'd be thrown in jail. If one man had two businesses and you commingled funds between the businesses, you'd go to prison. The county has 240 businesses right down to the dog catcher and they're commingling funds. And the courthouse is the biggest bank with the most money running the most people through there. And it's almost 100% pure profit. Is the courthouse bigger than the Wells Fargo branch? Yeah, if Wells Fargo had as much money per branch as the, in every county, they'd have big buildings too. But the court has more. Because the court can create any bond in any amount they want to and sell it under their international securities identification number. <coughs> They just arrest you for something, anything, little, an ordinance even.
and they create a cause of action that creates a case number, which creates a CUSA, which is attached to a bond, is sold under their ISLIN number out the back door of the courthouse to a broker, usually from Bear Stearns or somewhere like that, and it's invested on Wall Street into a municipal bond fund or a prison bond fund. And the judges own all the programs in the prison for the prisoners. They can't make any money off the bonds on Bonnie now because of her name and what we did. So they paroled her so they could force her into parole classes where the U.S. government pays $12,000 per prisoner to take each class. And the company that owns the classes, the school inside the prison, is owned by the judges in the state. <laughs> See, I follow the damn money. I find out where it's going, where it comes from. So let me tell you about a young woman down in, from San Antonio, became very successful working for a very large company, making almost $500,000 a year in salary. And she knew from the time she was a teenager, she had had a problem with being addicted to drugs. So she voluntarily went to one of those very expensive places like the Betty Ford th the Drug Center, and she paid her own money, thousands of dollars a month out of her pocket to solve her problem on her own. She mentions on social media and talks to her friends about the drug problem and about the, the place she was going and everything else. Cops come to her house one night, arrest her. She goes into court. She gets tried. And the judge says that private drug hospital that you're going to that's so good, we're just going to put you in prison and make you attend one of our drug treatment programs because the judge owns the drug treatment program. And they get federal funding for making them do that. And the feds pay the prison who pays the judge's corporation in the drug treatment program. So what happens to her $5,000 a year job? She's been in there, well, November was nine months, so 10, 11, going on in a year. What happened to her house? How about her cute little new Mercedes she rewarded herself with? She's a 42-year-old single black woman. Solving her own problems with her own money, living a good life. And now she's lost her job. She's lost her. What's the odds of her getting a job as a felon? When she gets out for 500000 a year. Zip. Her career is over. <clears throat> Did she deserve that? No. Was there a victim? No. She is a victim no. of the courts. No. This is stuff that's got to quit. I am tired of talking to female prisoners. I can't find any that belong there. We've been looking. Bonnie and I have been looking. Bonnie had no idea. You know, the average person out there, before you knew any of this stuff, somebody had been to prison, well, what did you do wrong? And that's what the public perception is. What did you do wrong? What did you do? They got you there. Now she's in prison, and I'm talking to these other prisoner ladies, and I'm trying to find something they did wrong that hurt another individual. And I can't hardly find any. I found one woman. And this, this story, oh my gosh, this one hurts. She's 17 years old. She was dating a 21-year-old boy. He took her out one night, proposed, and they celebrated. And he got a little drunk. 
And the bartender took the keys away from him, gave them to the 17-year-old girl who had a driver's license and wasn't drunk, had only had one, wasn't drunk, <coughs> handed them to her to take him home and made him her promise that she would take him home. So they walked out to the parking lot together and the 21-year-old man, boy, made her get in the passenger seat and took the keys away from her. And she's yelling at him, she's screaming at him, she's telling him, you're not fit to drive, I wanna get home, blah, blah, blah. He says, shut the door and let's go. I'm okay. And they drive through town and they hit somebody in a crosswalk and killed him. The 21 year old man was sentenced to life in prison. We got the death penalty. And the state has now ended his life. And her being an unwilling passenger having done nothing the lawyers told her she was going to get 60 years scared her to death told her she could plea for 40 if she just signs this document scared her to death 17 years old she signs the document there by a contract never had trial never had due process never had an argument by two attorneys or whatever in a court never got to see a judge other than her little arraignment plead guilty or not guilty right and has now she is now 40 years old she's been there since she was 17 in the same building bonnie's in now she didn't do a thing. That was some prosecutor wanting to tell some family of some victim that they got them prosecuted. They can never do this to anybody else again. And he made the paper. We found the newspaper article. Did, did she deserve that? 17 years old, she's 40. She's eligible for parole in 2028. She shouldn't even have been there in the first place. I'm telling you, I could tell you, sit here, for the next three days or two days telling you story after story after story. I'm not going to do that. But we can't find anyone in prison with Bonnie where there was a true victim of the crime. Did some of those people make a mistake? Yeah. They had drugs. They got drunk. They had did various things. That's called a drug treatment program. That's what they should have been sentenced to. Not prison. They should have got forced to have help. <laughs> That's funny, Sadie. That's funny. I am so mad, and I get madder every day. I'm trying to tell you, I don't even know how to remain calm anymore and how to keep the stress level down. I have bled so much in the last five, six, seven months. You wouldn't believe it. And my heart bleeds. We've got to do something about this. Taking down the eight. Title 18 is my mission. For those of you that don't know what Title 18 is, it's the criminal code. It's the criminal code. 
it is completely unconstitutional. I'm going to prove it. If I have to take a moment to the Supreme Court. Which you will. Yeah, I know. You can't hear her. So, Title 18 is, is the criminal code. She's going to prove it, even if she's got to take it all the way to the Supreme Court, which is what she just said, and she will have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. That is unconstitutional. That is unconstitutional. Exactly right. The problem, the reason is they're using it against the people. They're not supposed to be using it against the people. It's for the people to use against government officials who are corrupt. That's what it's for. It's not for the, the, the corrupt politicians, corrupt DOJ, corrupt FBI to use against you. It's not for that. It was never designed for that. But we let them get away with it because they they had us do unconscionable contracts that we didn't know about, right down to our mother before we were born. When our mother walked into that foundling hospital and gave birth to us, she signed an unconscionable contract as an informant, giving us up to the state through a birthing ward where they took our soul and our blood and our life and sent us out to see where we're presumed dead. And part of the seminar is going to, this weekend is on the presumption of death. Because you're all dead. Until you've reached the status of in full life, where you're declared in full life, you are dead. And that's what we all have to achieve where we've reached the status we're in full life. See, being an American state national is great. It's also known as an American national. They're literally one and the same. We're not U.S. nationals and we're not U.S. citizens. We're Americans. First and foremost, sons and daughters of God. A creator who created this world. Yeah. And boy, this world is old, yet mankind is young. In the middle of March, when our moon changes, we will enter our 6,000th year since Adam. We figured that out now. Because that when that moon changes, that's the one and a quarter day month of Nissan. And then we enter April in the middle of March. And April goes for 28 days. And then it becomes May because April is the Alpha and Omega month. The beginning and the end. We've got to understand that. There's 13 months of 28 days in God's calendar. 45 years before Christ, they created the Julian calendar. Before that, we were on God's calendar, which was a Hebrew calendar, and they've lost some of that guidance over a few centuries. The Greeks lost it a little bit. Um, the Aztec calendar, they lost it by several years. And then the Gregorian calendar, which we've been under, that just made it worse. Constantine in 321 brought Christianity into paganism. And we became pagans. And we worship the sun. We don't even know what day the Sabbath is. And yet in the Bible, we're commanded to understand and to keep the Sabbath day holy. And we don't even know which day of the week it is. So for all you Sunday worshipers out there, I'm sorry. I truly am. That's why they had to rush on Friday to crucify Christ and get him up and get him dead before the sun set on Friday night. 
Okay. You've got to understand God's calendar. Deck is 10. It ain't, it ain't the 12th month. Okay. Please understand. They have lied to you about everything. We're true seekers in this movement, if nothing else. If we don't call ourselves anything else, we seek the truth. Are we always right? No. We're not always right. We're striving to always be right. We strive for it. That's what we're commanded to do. We're just imperfect sinners. We're men and women who make mistakes, but we keep trying. We don't give up. God knows I've had more than my share of opportunity to quit. You won't believe how many times Costa Rica or Argentina have called my name. Well, I don't quit. Ever. Ever. So I'm going to read you something out of the Bible. And ye shall teach them that the law of consecration is the holiest and most sacred law of all the laws of God. And it is this law that govern the celestial glories of the kingdom of God. Behold, it is this law that bringeth the greatest amount of joy and happiness to an eternal soul. And if it is so be that ye could teach this law unto your children and cause them to live by this law in mortality, then would they have peace and happiness among them all the days of their probation. I find that's a very interesting word. That's what we're here on earth. We're all on probation. We're subjected to the evils of Satan and his minions. And we're on probation here. We're being tested to learn the difference between what's right and what's wrong. That's our job. It's the only job we have. And then to do what's right. Nevertheless, the requirements of this law are opposed to the plan of Lucifer, whose purpose and intent hath always been centered in selfishness. And he hath great power and influence over the hearts of the children of men, and this because of the veil that hath been placed over their minds, that they do not remember the things of the Father. For the law of consecration is this, that all those who live this law shall give of all that they have been blessed with, yea, even from each according to his abilities, to each according to their needs, that all might be blessed equally according to their needs and their wants. And their wants shall only be those things that they shall need, and they shall not want that which they do not need. You want to go to heaven, you give up everything. You go fight with all you've got. Whether you're blessed with riches or blessed with talent, doesn't matter. Go use those talents and those riches to do good for your fellow human beings. That's it. This is how we got the 13 royal families together. This page, these scriptures that I just read to you, got all the 13 royal families to understand that they were just merely the trustees for the benefit of the people of the world in the end times. And that will bring in the thousand years of peace. When there is no rich and there is no poor and all men are equal, And the rich have something that they give to the poor, and the poor have talents they give to the rich. And when everyone is equal, 
then this world will be consecrated with peace. And you'll all be in heaven. And the ones that don't do that, well, they're going the other way. I ain't telling. <laughs> I want you to go find it. I want you to look it up. Don't take my word for anything. I read and I read and I read until my eyes bleed, and then I read some more. And I try and impart that knowledge to you. I don't want you to believe me. Go find it. I can prove it to you over and over and over again and everything. And right now, I'm going to prove to you why the name changes aren't working for people out there yet. Because they can work. I'm telling you how important it is. It's incredibly important. The name change is important, but you have to have some some understandings. You One, you've got to tie your body to your name. It's the only thing you have. Tie it to your name and then stand on it. Then you can stand on it under God. Because I could be called a number, a number of things. David Lester Strait, all caps, that's a commercial name. It's bonded. It's under admiralty. It's a legal name, and it's controlled by the Internal Revenue Service. Okay? David L. Period straight, upper and lower case. That's my SSI name, or now it's SSA. See, they had to change their corporation too. All these government agencies go bankrupt and then they have to slightly vary the name. So we went from the United States of America, the United, which was a verb, States of America, to the United States of America to the United States, to U.S.A. to U.S. Inc., back to United States, back to U.S. Inc. without the dots. How many times have we gone bankrupt? And now we're at the proud moment of the White House Office, Inc., that's the name of the corporation. Joseph R. Biden is the agent of service. I just told you where Ezra Cohen admitted he'd been dead for years. We've had five or six Biden actors out there. Everybody knows it's not him. Facial recognition software tells you it's not him, for one. <laughs> this whole thing's a show. The whole thing's a farce. we got to wake up to it. Once we wake up to it, we change America. We do. Not them. We do. We tell our sheriffs now we ain't consenting. Get the hell off our property. This is my land. What are you coming onto my property to trespass against me for? What right do you have to do that? Another man tell me what to do. Get off and do it fast. We got to stop thinking as debtors. We're creditors. We are the full faith and credit of the United States of America, that government that lives in our hearts. Understand that's where we live. God gave us that right. It didn't come from the Constitution and it didn't come from Congress. Congress is just a bunch of baboons. They're all squirrels in my world gathering nuts. All these people. That's all they're doing. 
and I don't care a damn thing about them. Uh, then they better do what's right if they're going to take on the responsibility. And they better benefit us. And that's all I care about. I don't care who they are, what party they're from, what they do. Just the parties alone were there to divide us. We're not going to be divided anymore, are we? No. You're going to let somebody three years in with an ego divide you? No. No. Love everybody. Tell them they can go their own way if they want, but they're idiots. They'll come back around. Love them again. Don't burn the bridge. Just keep your heart open. They'll figure it out. Everybody's got to make their own mistakes. Love them the same. Doesn't matter. David Lester Strait, upper and lower case. That's my proper name on the land. The land jurisdiction of this nation. Property rights. It's me. It's my God-given name by my parents. My mom chose my first name, my dad chose my middle name, and my last name, well, that's the familial name. Didn't have a choice in the matter. If they were smart, we would have followed the Norwegianers years ago, the Swedes and the Netherlands. And every generation, we would have changed our last name. Because, boy, you wouldn't believe how many families I run into where in their county, their entire family whether they've done nothing or not, if they've got this last name, they're being persecuted because of one other family member 10, 20 years ago did something. And now their whole family name has a bad reputation. And by God, even if you're not related and you got the same name, you move into that county, God help you. And I've seen that in this country. We're persecuted by our last name, by the sins of others that had our last name. <clears throat> David Lester, upper and lower, I mean all lowercase, with the last name straight, with a capital letter straight, is the familial beneficiary name. Isn't that interesting? Straight, comma, David Lester, all caps is our U.S. Post Office designation. Yeah, I'm a post office. Straight, all caps, comma, David Lester, upper and lower case, is owned by the Vatican. I'm sure my parents didn't give them ownership. <laughs> Straight, comma, David Lester, upper and lower case. It's owned by the United States military under military jurisdiction under the UCMJ. <laughs> All other variations of the name can be used against you. You know, this was my purpose for the deed of reconveyance years ago, is to put the combinations of your name on there, re-deeding them under, reconveying them under one name and filing it on the county records. They couldn't hold me under David Lester straight all caps. They arrested me again. They couldn't hold me under David L's period straight. All caps. Why couldn't they? Because I did paperwork that solved those issues. And then somebody read my deed of reconveyance and found one of my names that I didn't put on there. And on a case that was already adjudicated, where I was charged with four charges, all misdemeanors, Two were dropped and two I just paid the ticket. And I got a check back from the city. You know, it was adjudicated. 
the county comes in who wasn't at the scene of the crime and they picked up the two charges that were dropped and they've made one a misdemeanor A and one a misdemeanor B or C. One, one's a C and one's an A. Okay, doesn't matter what it is. One wouldn't even exist without the other. So there's only one that have any importance. Okay. Every document I filed on my case, they they have done nothing with it. Every document I fi filed on my case under federal law is an automatic dismissal of the case. Automatic. It's an administrative dismissal. Every single document I filed should just wipe the case off the records. They have done nothing except marked it inactive with warrants. They've marked my case inactive with warrants. The warrants are only good in the county and the surrounding counties. Yeah. Yeah. It's right on the docket. And, and then they kind of put a hit out on me on all counties in Texas through email. I love their little threats. And I know why they threatened me. I know what I said to stir them up. I know when I said it. I know what we did, what actions we took to stir them up. I know what family is behind it. I know what family owns the police force. I know what family owns the judges and owns the court. In fact, they own all the courts in Texas. They own all the police forces in Texas, one family. They control it through the Grand Lodge in Fort Worth and uh, through all 900 Mason Halls in Texas, which all the judges and all the attorneys and all the police are members of. And they control the whole thing through that one family. And I pissed them off. And they're only worth 10.8 billion. That's their net worth. <laughs> I did, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I really pissed him off. Okay, that's all right. So. Oh, I just figure if I got to do it, to do it in a big way. Will I be removed from all that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'll come to an end. See, one thing you guys ought to know of me by now is I always win. It might seem like one little failure after another little failure after another failure, and I look at it as a win after a win after a win after a win after a win. After a win. And I can show you where we won, time and time and time again. Didn't I have the prettiest mug shot on earth? <laughs> I was smiling because I knew what was going on and I knew what they had done and they didn't know what they had done. Okay. So after these name variations, I want to show you how dumb we all are and how much we can learn from our mistakes. Because this is so important. It's it's ridiculous. I, thanks to a friend, Richard Anthony, court cases on fictitious names, court cases on fictitious names. The following court cases deal with objections to one's name. So here's the problem you all have, and I've had it and we all have it. We're state nationals, we wake up, we wake up about this much, we're usually in trouble because we did, and we go into court and we say the things that we should say. We do the right thing, we're the perfect quarterback sometimes. Sometimes we're a little less than perfect. But we do the right thing and they rule against us. 
They rule against us because we didn't know enough. We have to learn precept upon precept. We have to make our mistakes. Sometimes they hurt. Sometimes we get better. But I'm going to teach you some things this weekend about the course that you all didn't know. And it's something I've learned. The fat lady never sings. There's your lesson. I'm telling you the end before the middle. The fat lady never sings in court. It's never over. Everybody thinks it's over. They go into court, they lose, they think, oh, shoot, the judge ruled against me, it's over. All right. Most of these people learned a little bit, and they, they started arguing in court that the name is spelled wrong, or the name is all in all caps, or the name is this, or the name is that, and the courts continue to rule against them all the time. So we can learn something about these negative, what I call negative rulings, okay? Russell versus United States. Petitioner claims because his name is in all capital letters on the summons, he is not subject to the summons, completely without merit, patiently frivolous, and will be rejected without expending any more of this court's resources. To argue that your name is spelled in all caps is wrong. It's a wrong argument, because then you're admitting it is your name. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Your admitting is your name. A name spelled in all caps is not your name. And to say it is your name gives jurisdiction to the court. Instead of saying, my name is spelled in all caps on your papers, one should say, my godly name does not appear on your papers. So we just change the words a little bit? One little tweak in a sentence, and it would have made all the difference. These are the mistakes we make as imperfect human beings, and then we get punished for being imperfect. Instead of saying, my name is spelled in all caps on your papers, one should say, my godly name does not appear on your papers. This is interesting because what we did is we came up with these court cases, and we came up with these mistakes, and the judges fixed it for us and gave us the answers. A lot of times a judge in your case will give you the answer, and you didn't hear it, and you walked out. And he told you how you could have corrected it, and you didn't hear it. He was helping you. And you walked out going, that blanky blank judge, he's so corrupt. And he gave you the answer. They're not all corrupt. Some of them try. Wyatt versus Kelly, who was a chief bankruptcy court judge of Texas, by the way, <laughs> tried to sue a judge for violating his civil rights by having his name printed in court documents in a way other than the appellation. His last name was uh, Crank. Crank reacted by refusing to respond to prosecution's complaint, whereupon the judge entered a not guilty plea on his behalf. The suit against the judge was dismissed. So he tried to sue the judge. The, the case was dismissed because of what he was arguing. So let's fix it. In civil rights, when, which have men for their author, are an abomination to God because it creates state worship. If you partake of a man's created rights, you are under the power of the creator of those rights, the man. The creator determines what the created violated, not the other way around. By him admitting his name was spelled incorrectly, he admitted it was his name, and he again gave jurisdiction to the court. 
scripture forbids us to go to courts of law and commands us not to sue others, but to forgive others. Therefore, if he gave jurisdiction to the court simply by being lawless in God's eyes. Now, sometimes we have to go to court. They're coming after you. And they ain't going to stop until you go to court and beat them or give up. Surrender. One or the other. Dauk versus U.S. As a South Dakota, uh, South Dakota case. He claims that the use of his name in all caps with the middle initial is an illegal misnomer and use of said name violates the right to his lawful status. And it was rejected by the court. Basically, John confessed to and answered to his name in all caps. Since by doing so, he gives jurisdiction to the court. It is no longer an illegal misnomer. Did you understand what I said? Okay. U.S. versus French. Defendants' assertion that the capitalization of their names in court documents constitutes constructive fraud, thereby depriving the district court of jurisdiction and venue is without any basis in law or fact. The defendant admitted it was their name and answered to that name. So how can it be fraud? So the court corrected him and ruled against him. When the court told him what was wrong in the case, they told him his error. Giving wrong reasons in U.S. versus Washington. Finally, the defendant contends that the indictment must be dismissed because Kurt Washington spelled out in capital letters is a fictitious name used by the government to tax him inappropriately as a business and that the correct spelling and presentation of his name is Kurt Washington in upper and lower case. This contention is baseless. Why is it baseless? Because he admitted it was his name. The accused made the wrong or argument. True, it is a fictitious name. This is what the court said. The court said, true, it is a fictitious name. However, to say it is used because the government wants to tax him improperly as a business is hypothetical and speculative. Opinions are not law and have no standing in law. There are no other reasons why the government uses fictitious names and to claim this one without proof is not a reason to dismiss the case. So see how the court told him what he did wrong? Jagger versus Du... I'll screw up the name of this county. Dubuque County, North Dakota... The court finds Jager's arguments concerning capitalization otherwise spacious. The court routinely capitalizes the names of all parties before the court in all matters, civil and criminal, without any regard to their corporate or individual status. The court qualified the term status. The court did not say without regard to their status, but only to their corporate or individual status. Under the law, corporate and individual status is identical. A maximal law says, the law which governs corporations is the same as that which governs individuals. Jager's error was as follows. Either he admitted he was an individual or he did not rebut the presumption by his accusers that he was an individual. Can't use the word individual either. See, these things we learn from, right? Davis versus Deddens, Ohio. I believe that not only is this case subject to dismissal, but is also subject to sanctions under Rule 11. Making a distinction between all capital letters and capital and small letters is frivolous. 
litigant tried to deny validity of a traffic ticket because it printed the court's name in all caps. It does not matter how the court's name is spelled. It was spelled correctly since it is a fiction. It has no bearing on the validity on a traffic ticket. Similar court ruling in drug prosecution case of U.S. versus Whack, Whacker with the Tenth Circuit. So those are two court cases that ruled exactly the same. Somebody went in there and said, the court's name's not right. We make lots of mistakes, guys. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Get over it. Yeah. Don't worry about other people's mistakes. Learn from them all. Don't call them a bunch of names or backbite or bicker. We're in the same damn foxhole. Our enemy is the cabal. It's out there. It's not in there. Rippy versus IRS, the plaintiff's response consists of nothing more than a protest against the capitalization of his name in the caption. Accordingly, summary judgment is granted in favor of defendants and against the plaintiff. The same ruling is in Hancock versus State of Utah. I can go on and on and on. There are similar cases, hundreds of them. There is literally hundreds of them on the name being spelled one way or the other. It is not the name spelled one way or the other. It is the status that the name creates. It's the, the ruling that your name creates. Did you have the intent to separate yourself from one of God's children to be in a corporate fiction? <laughs> I've been talking to Zadie a lot and Bonnie a lot on what I call the roots of the tree. The tree is a perfect example of our courts and our cases. The branches of the tree are our facts. Lawyers say no truth or fact shall be tried in court. <laughs> that's their motto that's the bar association's motto no truth or fact shall be tried in court what happens to a tree when you prune its branches new growth it gets stronger it gets better the roots go down deeper they it's harder to kill the tree gets stronger. We argue facts all the time. Facts don't matter. Bonnie was so bad at this. She could argue the fact off of anything. She could. And I kept chastising her for it. And I don't like chastising her. But for her, it was all about the facts, all about the facts, all about the facts, the truth and the facts. Well, that's great. Everybody should put their affidavit of truth and facts into a case and then forget about it. Do your affidavit of truth and facts and put it into the record and forget about it, except for standing on it in a hearing. But that's not the argument. The biggest argument is, did the court or the police or whoever, some agency of government, did they have the authority to even talk to you in the first place, to take you into court in the first place? Did they have the status? Did they have the standing? If you've separated yourself and you've corrected your errors and your contracts and you have the right status, did they have the status to talk to you in the first place? Okay, let's solve this right now and I'm gonna solve Kiki's problem. I love Kiki, I really do. She's not right all the time. So I'm gonna solve her problem right now. 
not a, not an issue. It is the understanding of our court system today. We have the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. And the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is higher, with higher jurisdiction than the Supreme Court of the United States because it was created first. The UCMJ was created before that. And it has the highest authority. Our military is in control, by the way. They have the highest authority. Now, whether these three star generals are all corrupt or not, that's a, a, anyway. Whole nother class. So, we have the Supreme Courts. Congress, through our Constitution, we the people gave the federal government in our first Constitution the ability of our Congress to create Article Three courts. How many did they create? Who knows the answer? See, shit. No. Congress created 94 district courts that are Article 3, 13 appellate courts that are Article 3. And there is approximately, and this number is changing right now, so it's fluid. There are 36 chancery courts in the United States. Set that aside for a minute. I'm going to talk about that later. 36 chancery courts. What is a chancery court? Anybody know? It's a court of equity. It's the king's court. The king can set aside any laws he wants to in the interest of justice. But only in the interest of justice. Only the interest of freedom and liberty. Only in the interest of justice can he set his own laws aside. That's a king's court, is a court of chancery. The best chancery court in the United States is in Delaware. Tennessee has gone from three chancery courts in the last two years since this happened and we went back to common law, they've gone from three to 26. Michigan, Mississippi, and Texas have also created chancery courts with such terrible limitations, it's pretty much mute point until we but it's a step in the right direction it's a little tiny baby step michigan and mississippi limited their chancery courts to just a few things it's terrible now texas did even worse here's what texas did there are no chancery courts there are no equity courts in texas took that to six judges Tried to move Bonnie into equity. She's trying to move into equity to six judges. You can't move into equity in Texas until. See my little butt right there? But how you move into Texas is there is one man who is elected and serves a 12 year term called the Master of Chancery. They made one man the king, elected by the people. And wasn't that cool? Texas courts made one man king, elected by the people, for a 12-year term at a time. And he's called the Master of Chancery. Now, here's how you get to him if you live in Texas. You work your way through the county court system. You go into the appellate court and you fail and you go take it to the Texas State Supreme Court and you fail again. And you prove to the Texas State Supreme Court that you've got no remedy at law. No remedy at law. Once you've failed at all the courts, 
with all those judges, and the appellate court is a three-judge panel, right? So you've already gone through five, six judges by now. Once you've done that, and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed at law, and you did not receive remedy, and you proved beyond a shadow of a doubt to the Texas State Supreme Court that you can't get remedy at law, well, then you can petition for equity through the master of chancery of this Texas State Supreme Court. And he can set aside all those statutes in order to achieve justice and get you remedy. And that's his job. And that's how Texas set up their chancery court. That's expensive, working your way all the way up to there and all that time and all that. He might be there a while. It's not going to be a speedy remedy. But that's how you get an equity court in Texas. What's that? Oh, no. In Delaware, you can go right to the Delaware Chancery Court and pass go. Same with Tennessee. Oh, wait a minute. I'll get to Maine and Virginia and a few. Maine and Virginia are now under common law. No more admiralty in Maine and Virginia. Isn't that cool? This freaking country's actually moving in the right direction now that everybody's pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to piss people off for 30 years. And it, because it isn't until we get pissed off that we get off the couch and, and football's no longer important. We got to get mad. We got to go do things. And until we get mad enough, it's not important. All right, I'm. I got something right here. You know, it's hard to lick your fingers when this is in your way. I pulled this off of uh, Tennessee Chancery Court's websites. Just a couple of pages. Uh, this one happened to be in Franklin County. Franklin County Chancery Court is a 12th judicial district, which consists of six counties. So the, count, the uh, Chancery Court in Franklin represents six of Tennessee's counties. Okay. There's 23 Chancery Courts, 26 now. They just went from 23 to 26 in Tennessee. But there's more counties than that. So they share. So Franklin, Marion, Grundy, Bledsoe, Ray, and Sequatchie counties are all under the Franklin Chancery Court. And the chancellor for their judicial district is Melissa Thomas Willis. All three names properly spelled in upper and lower case. And that yeah, beautiful, right there off their website, her proper name. What? That's up to you. Which court do you walk in? See, it's always up to the people. She asked me if they, that replaced other courts that were out there. I said, that's up to you. Which one do you walk in? You have options. Chancery Court is a court of equity, having concurrent jurisdiction with circuit court actions, such as divorces, so concurrent, which means there's two choices, in actions such as divorces, civil cases, unliquidated damages, jury trials are not a common occurrence in Chancery Court yet, but are conducted when demanded. Ah, so we can go in with a mandate, which is a writ. It's an order from the people. 
It's up to us to mandate our public servants, not them to mandate us. That's shit made up. Okay? It's our job to put in mandate, writs of mandamus. Writs of mandamus. So, we also collect things such as property taxes and conduct delinquent tax sales. Let me tell you what they just did with that sentence. This is so cool. Remember, these guys always put things in negative form. So I'm gonna read the sentence again, and then I'm gonna tell you what it means to somebody like me. Not the common individual, for sure. So watch. We also collect delinquent property taxes and conduct delinquent tax sales. Now, to me, that is so cool because if I spin it like I'm supposed to and I take it from a debtor to a creditor, I go, I can fight my delinquent property taxes and remove my delinquent tax sale. That's the place to go. See, that's how we have to think. So I printed off their filing fees and costs. See, the nice thing about the king's court is you only pay to the king. And the king's usually cheaper than the county. And he charges you according to the value and what it takes to get remedy. So it's got a long list of fees. It's like a menu. That's three pages. And if you order a hamburger and not a steak, you only have to pay for the hamburger and not the steak. See, in county courts, you got to pay for the steak and maybe you'll get a good hamburger. So they got fees and my bad eyes, I'm going to have a hard time with this because it's small. A divorce in involving minor children, the fee is $299. Go hire an attorney and go to the other court and see what it costs you. You can go in here for 299 bucks. Be done with it. Anybody got a pair of readers? <laughs> People laugh at me because I refuse to admit my eyes are going bad. They're graded a long distance, but notice a notice to creditors. You make the check payable to the Herald Chronicle. <laughs> the king says, don't make it to me. He says, make it, make your check out to the Herald Chronicle and we'll put the notice into your creditors for $120. <laughs> you want to settle your estate, a small estate, put in your affidavit, and it's $140.50. A motions or petitions to modify an existing case is $77. A conservatorship is $259.50. They break it down to the penny. See, civil rights suits, tax disputes, and special remedies are three hundred twenty-four dollars and fifty cents. If you want to transfer your, your case from the county to the chancery court, it's one hundred fifty-two dollars. If you want to appeal your case from the county to the Chancery Court, it's $249.50. If you would like to do a writ of Satori, it's $249.50. If you want to do a condemnation or inverse condemn, con, condemnation, it's $249.50. 
if you want to do it in adoption, it's 199 bucks. Paternity or termination of parental rights, if you want to argue that, it's 199.50. A name change, right here. Name change. Minor settlements. A restoration of citizenship is $199.50. Orders of protection is a hundred bucks. A civil expungements are a hundred dollars. So you can go get your county cases expunged for a hundred bucks. <laughs> now I don't know what a category four case is, but it's seventy seven dollars. Modifications to parenting plans are seventy seven dollars. Civil contempt actions are $77. You starting to get what I'm saying? Yeah. They're fair and equitable. We need chancery courts in the United States. Contact your state legislatures and let's get on it. Okay, the question was, can someone in Texas who wants to do a name change, can it be done in Tennessee? And the answer to that is yes. You just need an address in Tennessee. See, I have an address in Oregon, so I went up there and I got mine and Bonnie's name changed in Oregon because of the damn liberal courts are easier to deal with than the conservative courts. Okay. Later. Okay, hold on. We can't be doing all these questions and answers. We're going to, but they will disrupt the hell out of things. I love questions and answers. All right. Well, who's running my clock? Do you see a wristwatch on me? <laughs> You were back there doing this? I just thought you were saying hi. <laughs> All right, it's 125. I guess people want some lunch. Let's take a break. Be back in an hour. Well, I got to speed up. Boy, keeping all this straight in my head is not easy. And trying to do it in two days is not easy either. And there's a lot to cover over the next couple of days. So if everybody can come in and sit down and be quiet, that'd be great. All right, I want to really quick before I go back into the courts and talk about that, I want to talk about Adam and Bo and Freeman, or Freeman Bot. These guys have the ability to change this country with our help. All of us. And we're going to be putting a lot of documents on there that everybody can go to, everybody can do. It's going to expand. Freeman Boss is going to be better than state national U.S. ever was. But it's more important than that. So I want to get this through your heads. President Trump called AI the most dangerous thing to mankind. Elon Musk said it was the most dangerous thing to mankind. Elon is on a little mission right now, and that is to make AI righteous. Elon is. 
Now, how we do that is partly by Freeman bot. If evil is doing AI, righteousness needs to do AI. If we leave it up to evil, it's all going to be evil. And it's going to destroy everything. It has the capability Terminator comes to mind. <laughs> okay, the movie Terminators, right? Or Terminator movies. But if we can do it righteous, let me tell you something right off the bat. God tells us a righteous man can cast evil out and bind it and turn it over to God. And if we can develop a righteous AI to bind evil and cast it out and turn it over to God, there won't be an evil AI. See, that's how powerful God is. God says one man has the power to cast out all evil demons. So it doesn't matter how evil they are and how big they are. All we got to do is teach AI to cast out of AI the evil. Isn't that cool? You understand how important that is? I know we're all afraid of AI. Every one of us are. That's why we're doing it. Because we're scared to death of AI and what it could do if left by itself. It'll be just as bad or worse uh, by a thousand times as our corrupt government. Because we stayed out of government for so long, it's gotten so bad. Now it's coming back to bite our own ass. We can't let AI do that. It'll do it 10 times, 10,000 times more. But it just takes a little AI with God's words to cast the evil out of all of AI. It doesn't even take as much. It could be a pencil compared to this whole room. See? That's the power of it. I encourage everybody to get on a free man bot and start supporting it. And it's costs a lot of money to develop you guys don't realize the cost the minimal charges i know it seems like a lot sometimes but the minimal charges it takes to create that and get that going it's like tip money compared to the work adam and bo and his team their teams are putting in it's a team of people doing this Support it all you can. I've never asked anybody to support more than they can afford. But I have asked you to have a vested interest in your own education. That's important because we, if something's free, you do nothing with it. I've, I've tried 30 years or 20 years of that anyway, and it didn't work. But when you have a vested interest in yourself and your education and your family and your friends and you understand the big picture and you start giving back to that big picture, that's worth everything. Okay? Everything. So keep that in mind. We're going to be uploading more and more stuff. I've got a ton of stuff to hand to those guys this weekend. And more to come. So it's going to continue to grow. Growth is slow at first. It's painfully slow sometimes. We all wish we could just snap our fingers and have this all be done and none of this would be necessary and you'd all have your trust and everybody would be happy. And believe me, that's coming. We know it's coming. We can see it. We can see the change. But it doesn't come without pain and persistence and effort from us all. Okay? Understand that. 
This is already on Freemanbot. This was the old 10 steps, which is now more. But here's what we did. See, the 10 steps was for phase one, two, and three. It gets you to a certain point, and then you used to have to spend a lot of time learning from me to feel comfortable enough to go into a federal court and get access to your trust. And very few people can even pull it off. It's not their fault. I don't blame anyone, no one. I blame our parents, our grandparents, our government, and everybody else in the past for letting it get this bad anyway, for making it this hard. Should never have been hard. Should have been easy. If we could go back to 1900 and take care of some things before 1933, this would have all been over. Okay? But that whole Federal Reserve banking bull crap making us all slaves and now worldwide slaves, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. Now we got a job to do. And we got to buckle our shoes and get it done. And it's going to take some work. It's going to take some effort uh, for all of us. And it could be as simple as a few things I'm about to talk about. Very few things. So first of all, this is the list. You, you can get it off Freemanbot. Um, I think we are going to put it on a channel or two later, but free man bot right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to take all that difficulty of going to the federal judge out of the picture. What if I said we could get a, not all, but a big chunk of your estate right off the bat? Okay, remember when I talk about when I talk about Wells Fargo and your main checking account is your birth certificate trust, the one that set up your account in the first place, your main account. And then you go back in, you get your social security number account, and that's like a, a savings account. And then you go back in and you get another account, maybe a student ID account. And a, and you just build up all these different accounts, but they're all included in your estate, your trust. One of the biggest portions of that is your Social Security estate. And what if I told you we know how to just go get it? Okay, pay attention the rest of the weekend. <laughs> So we were talking about our courts turning over to common law courts. They're doing that slowly. Maine and Virginia already have. Tell you what Oregon did. Oregon actually passed a law that says a person who's going to law school can go to law school and graduate. She can go to work for an attorney firm for four months and practice law in the state of Oregon without ever having to pass a bar or be a bar member. Hmm. Okay, one of our most liberal states in the United States just found a way to begin, it's a step, right? It's not the top of the stairs, but it's a step to getting rid of the bar in this country. Yeah. The law was passed last year. It took effect January 1st. It's already in effect. Right. Any new students graduating law school this spring can just go apprentice with a, it's like trade school for lawyers, <laughs> right? They go apprentice for four months and they can walk into a court just like a lawyer, just like a bar member. without a bar card. 
That is a huge step, huge, giant step for mankind. And I am talking about Neil Armstrong. <laughs> See, I think that's beautiful. And it's only a small step. All kinds of things are happening around this nation, a one little bit at a time that's making it a very exciting place to live and at the same time making it more scary. Okay? We got to get over the fear and just go do stuff. Some of us will be persecuted. The righteous always gets persecuted. We're in good company. It happened to all the apostles, it happened to Christ himself. Who persecuted Christ? It wasn't the Romans. Right, it was the Pharisees, the Jews, the Khazarian Mafia of the day. The ones that got kicked out of the, uh, Jerusalem, who fled up the Silk Road to Ukraine. I'm going to let you guys in on a little hint, and it's starting to come out more and more. I'm seeing these little hints and these little signs out there, and I just look at them, and it's stuff I've already known for a very long time, and I go, isn't that beautiful? Look at what just came out. I'm starting to see Christ's pictures that are getting more accurate to what he really looked like. See, those old paintings that you've seen of Christ were developed after about 300 years after his death, and they were painted, and the depiction of Christ was not right. That's not what he looked like. How do I know this? Because in a museum is a letter from Pontius Pilate to Caesar. And in this letter, Pontius Pilate describes Jesus, Christ, that word, Christ, that came later. Christ is a title, it's not his name. His name isn't Jesus Christ. That's not his first and his last name. Actually, no. Jesus' name is spelled I-E-S-U-S. -S. Write it down. I-E-S-U-S. -S. How do we know that? Because the period of time during his lifetime, that's how his name was written. I-E-S-U-S. -S. That's how he's described in Pontius Pilate's letter to Caesar as well. And they describe him. First of all, Mary and Joseph traveled a long, long way to Bethlehem. Okay? I'm going to give you a quick little history lesson to warm things up. A long, long, long way to Bethlehem. The Silk Road went from Scotland all the way down, and I'm going to name modern day countries so you understand what I'm saying. From Scotland through Ireland, through England, down through Germany and Poland, which is now Ukraine, through modern day Georgia, the country of Georgia, not the one in the United States. Modern day Georgia, which is a lot like Napa Valley. There's 5 million people in that whole country. And it's like one big valley with mountains on two sides. And the Silk Road went right down through the middle of it. And now it's all beautiful winery and grapes. It's a beautiful country to go visit if you want to go visit. And it went right into Constantinople, which wasn't called Constantinople back then. Okay? Which is Turkey. Then it went like this and over to Acre, which dabbled in northern Greece, Acre, Jerusalem, Egypt, and then over through China, 
and all the way down through Vietnam and to Thailand. And I'm using the modern day countries names. So Jesus of Nazarene, uh, not of Nazareth. Nazareth is a city that's close to Jerusalem, not too far. Did he travel not too far or did he travel a long, long way? <laughs> he traveled a long way. Naz was the name of the country. Irene, E-R-E-N-E, -E, was the name of the city where Joseph and Mary lived. It was a very industrious city along the Silk Road. And what is later became, went from Naz to Allegheny to Germany. And Christ had blonde hair, a dirty blonde hair with a red beard. And he was tall. And that description is in Pontius Pilate's letter because Pontius Pilate went to Jesus and offered him sanctuary because Jesus was speaking bad about the upper middle class people of Jerusalem, the Pharisees and stuff who wanted him dead. And they were and Pontius Pilate, the Romans were afraid they were going to kill Jesus. So he offered him sanctuary and the full backing and power of his office of Rome. And he was just an officer of Rome. So it's kind of like if Fort Hood, Texas, opened its doors to offer sanctuary from Texas. That's what it would be kind of like, or at least in this kid's best estimation. <laughs> Give you an idea. So they offered him sanctuary, fear he was going to be killed, and Jesus refused. And he went right back out and preached against the corruption of Jerusalem, the upper middle class, the Pharisees, the bankers, the ones God had already kicked out of Jerusalem several times. And it's the reason we're having problems in Ukraine now. We're having problems in the United States. We're having problems in Jerusalem. And we're having the same problems as Stalin and Hitler had. Hitler was beloved by his people. Understand that. They would have done anything for him, and they did. They fought and they died for him because he was trying to get the evil bankers to stop usury of his people. Stop foreclosing on their homes. Start lending them money they couldn't afford to repay at high interest rates to stop all these things. That's what they were doing. Same thing with Stalin. Our history book says he was killed 20 million of his own people. Well, what area of Russia did he kill those people in? Right down in that small area, which is basically Ukraine. They didn't, they didn't kill him in the rest of Russia. So Stalin wasn't out to kill his own people in the rest of Russia. He was killing people in that area who were usury, usury the people of Russia. Usury is lending them money they can't afford to repay, foreclosing on their houses, stealing their stuff. Same thing our courts do every day. Who's running this country? Who's our news media? Who's directing our news on TV? Who's programming? Who's running our CIA? Who's running our government? Same damn people over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it's the same problem we're having. And the Bible tells us how it's going to be fixed. It tells us why. He revealed everything to us. We know that there's going to be a massive bomb going off in northern 
Israel. A bomb that'll melt the skin off the people. Because the Bible says that. Well, what kind of bombs melt skin off people? God in the Bible told us when the next nuclear bomb is going to drop. And didn't Biden just test one in Nevada a few weeks ago? Did you guys know that? You got guys sitting as far away as Arizona, just over the river from Las Vegas, looking towards the south into town, and they watched a nuclear bomb go off in Nevada. And they were going, holy crap, was that our casinos? No. <laughs> it was a lot farther away than that. But they're seeing it. So back to common law, real quick, what's happening in this country. This is one of the most beautiful pieces of paper I've got my hand on a long time, isn't it, Zadie? Here's an attorney right here who's in love with this document. I sent it to her and she went, holy crap, this is the answer to our prayers. And I said, you're right. It's formed as a judicial notice, and it says right at the top, judicial notice is a form of evidence. We can put this paper, sign our name to the bottom, and put it in every court in America, in every one of your cases. I don't care if it's a traffic ticket or a felony. Go put it as a judicial notice into your case. And I've got more judicial notices. I have judicial notices that I put on every case. So I brought a few of my own with my name on it in my cases. I always put judicial notices on because I am setting them up at the window. When you do judicial notices in your case, you set them up at the window. Then if the local courts fail you, which they will, <laughs> you win at a higher court. That's how I got Bonnie out on a, uh, through the appellate court and released. She's still there. They refused to turn loose of her body, but her case was released. She was released and rearrested outside the door. But they'll do that. <clears throat> it is my immediate. <clears throat> Listen to the words very carefully. It is my immediate demand, wish, and order that you restore all that has been unlawfully taken without constitutionally mandated due process. All past cases that bypass the common law are unlawful. Justice Gorsuch. He, he goes on. In man versus man, 172P2D369,375776, Cal, California Appeals Court, 2D32, Justice Gorsuch said this. We don't usually say the government can avoid a constitutional mandate merely by relabeling it or moving things around. It is as much a violation to do something indirectly as it is directly. We usually say, right? A maximum, maximum law, 4B. He who does a thing by another is considered as doing it himself. That came out of Broome, and he quoted it. And he also says it's out of a collection of maxims of law by Charles A. Weissman. This is all coming from Gorsuch, this whole thing. Please take notice that as agency workers, state judges, presiding judges, state legislators, etc., that you are bound by the constitutions that you have all sworn to uphold. And from this time forward, please be advised that taking children, cars, houses, weapons, rights, property, etc., without a trial by jury, <laughs> 
them. Not no stinking jury trial. A trial by jury in a court of record. You guys know the difference, right? Do I got to go back to grade school here? Trial by jury means the jury makes a decision and is final. The judge can't overrule the jury's decision. A jury trial, the jury happens to be there and they make some opinion and then the judge can do what he wants with it, overrule it or whatever. That's the difference. And courts have not wanted to give us trial by juries for a very long time. <clears throat> In a court of record, following the course of the common law is hereby unlawful. He just screwed them, guys, right there. He took away all their authority. Now, remember what I was talking about. There's 94 district courts. There are how many? 13. Thank you. Thir you were listening. I was checking to see if you were awake after lunch. 13 appeals courts and 36 chancery courts in the United States that have the authority over criminals, criminal law. All inferior courts have no authority to prosecute a criminal whether by felony or misdemeanor. Oh, shoot. You know what? I foresee our jails emptying really soon. A friend of a friend who's a court clerk in one county in Missouri said the U.S. Marshals came in there for, for a few days and reviewed a whole bunch of cases, and they left with 194 files. And that is the same court that 13 judges have kind of gone by the wayside recently. So that's a little hint of what's been happening and what's being done on the backside of things. That is the, one of the most beautiful things I can tell you. It's happening, but we, the more of us that do this, the quicker it's gonna happen for all of us. You understand that? I don't even care if you got an old case that's dead 10 years. If the court case is still open and they'll still accept your documents through the court clerk, go file a bunch of judicial notices in it. Because if one U.S. Marshal reviews the docket of your old file, and maybe that was on your foreclosure of your home. What did I say? Hold on. Let me find it. Your children, your cars, your homes, everything they took from you will be returned. Now, they may not return that house because they can't damage somebody else who ha is living there now and thinks they own it, bought it. But they have to restore you the value. Wouldn't that be nice? For the one in ten of us right there that's beautiful well what if they took your kids away eight years ago what's that worth and, exactly right you see just the re, the restitution that's coming to the american people pretty soon Those that are, are, you are bound by the constitutions that you have all sworn to uphold and from this time forward, please be advised that taking children, cars, houses, weapons, rights, property, etc., without a trial by jury in a court of record following the course of the common law is unlawful. What a powerful statement. Please also take further notice that he ain't done. <laughs> Attorneys who don't have their name on the line 
as they are not in positions of service and contract with the people. How about an attorney assigned to you by some judge that you didn't hire, that you didn't sign a contract with, that you didn't? You see what I mean? As they are not in positions of service and contract with the people, presenting you with the idea that it's acceptable to trample the people's rights by device or artifice does not in any way remove your responsibility for your wrongdoings. Furthermore, there is another element of wrong being committed when you are working in a federal program and make money outside of your normal salary for carrying out the functions of that program, leaving one with unclean hands on top of taking property or rights from the people without right. That means goodbye to their homes. I'm telling you guys, this is this single piece of paper is incredibly valuable to the American people because it was written by Gorsuch. All past cases that bypass the common law are unlawful. Therefore, it is my immediate demand, wish, and order. I can hardly read this without getting choked up. <laughs> that you restore all that has been unlawfully taken without constitutionally mandated due process and notify all those who were harmed. It's their damn responsibility to notify us. When those cases are reviewed, put in the judicial notices and make it quick. I'm trying to tell you a hint here. Make it quicker. And notify all those who were harmed. Or you agree that any wrong that is done in this regard in the future or that has not been corrected from past trespasses is done purposely with full knowledge, intent, and malice and will be recognized as such by the people whom you swore to serve and protect. This notice is sent to you in the peace and love of Jesus Christ that you may repent and do works worthy of the same with emphasis added Hallelujah. How important is this document, Sadie? Come here. This is the most monumental document. This is the most monumental. Test, test, test. Test, test. You got a screen in here. I don't know. Tessie. There it goes. Can you hear me? Yes. Put it right to your mouth. This is the most monumental document that we have received from the Supreme Court. And I mean, even with Roe v. Wade, etc., in decades, because it has given us the framework for us to invalidate every single code, regulation of every statute that has been forced upon us ever since 1871. And it's up to us, it's up to us to understand what those things mean and apply them to each one of our specific cases because let me just let me go back up when justice Rehnquist was in, in in the supreme court he made a statement that i never quite understood and that statement was now 100% not 99%, 100% of every single prisoner who is or has been in prison, whether federal or state, is there voluntarily because they do not understand the law. 
and that sent chills down my spine. I never quite understood it, exactly what it meant, until now. I understand it very clearly now. Because back then, I didn't know anything about 1871. I didn't know anything about the corporation. I didn't know that every single statute, regulation, code that is imposed upon 100% of us at every single level is null and void ever since 1871 for fraud putting it mildly, and because it's unconstitutional. That document allows us to use the common law, which is what our Constitution guarantees us, and invalidate every single thing that they have done. Gorsuch not only did that for the current situation, he went retroactively back, which means that anybody that has been harmed because they did not follow the common law all the way back as far as 1871, every one of those is null and void. That's the importance of this, and it gives me chills to even mention that. Don't worry about that. Just go do it. Yeah. Let me tell you something. She said it very, very well. This gives a whole lot of people a very big paycheck in this nation. And you guys in this room, when you, because you're more up to speed than most of the people out there, you take documents like that and you go start helping people and you start creating some legal documents or learn how to create some legal documents based upon those things and you go start back and helping them. You guys want, all want to make a half a million a year without hardly doing anything? Yeah. If you can go give 50 million for somebody and they generously hand you a gift of a half a million, I rest my case. Okay. I've gotten a few very big paychecks that I never asked for. I've helped people with their IRS cases and saved them millions of dollars. And they came to me and said, David, here's a hundred grand. You know how nice that is? I didn't ask. I would have helped them for free because I love my people. But you don't refuse God's gifts. And you bless others with a willing heart and a helpful heart, and he will reward you. And that's how he rewards you. You just say, thank you. I appreciate it. See? And that's it. And every man is worthy of his hire. So if somebody helps you, you return the favor. You go give them a gift. Okay? And we all start helping each other that way. And we ain't worried about no stinking house payments. You see what I mean? You guys are so much farther ahead because of the knowledge you've been following for the last few years that there is so much opportunity to help others and gain your own success as a byproduct. You don't even have to think about the money. Somebody, that's, their kids were taken 10 years ago. What if you could go make that right? And they can't give you back 10 years of your children's life, but maybe that's worth 100 million. Would you kindly accept $10 million from me if you got me 100 million? Please take it from me. Do you understand that's how Americans should be with each other? And now you just bless two families beyond belief. It could be as little as 50000 and $5,000 payment. It doesn't matter what the money is. It doesn't matter. I don't even think about money. All, my only goal is to go out and help people. I do it from the minute I wake up in the morning to the minute I go to sleep. <sighs> And just do that. And God puts money in your pocket. 
count it as a blessing and move on to the next one. Okay? Here's another big thing that can help us. It's a case called Betterman, Better Man, Better Man, Betterman, one word, versus Montana. This was a Supreme Court case, so I'll give you the entire citation if you want to write it down. 578 U.S. 437, comma, 136 S period, C period, T period. 1609, comma, 194, comma, L period, ED, 2D, 723, and now in parentheses, 2016. Now I'm going to explain to you why you want the citations. First of all, the SCT is a Supreme Court of the United States, right? Supreme Court. So that tells you right there it's a Supreme Court case. It happened in 2016. It tells what the case is, what the page number it is, the docket number, and everything's right there. So cases have all these little numbers down the side on federal cases. It tells you where to go to look once you learn how to read citations, okay? Head note 12 of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, the defendant will ordinarily earn time served credit for any period of pre-sentencing detention. 18 U.S.C. 3585B state crediting statutes routinely provide that any period of time during which a person that is incarcerated in relation to a given offense will be counted towards satisfaction of the resulting sentence. Such detention may occur in the local jail rather than in prison. So they'll even count the local jail time leading up to the sentence, okay? They're supposed to count everything. Okay? You know they gave Bonnie 32 days credit going into the second sentence when she was sentenced before and served eight months uh, ankle monitor at home, 16 days in solitary confinement, all these things she had to do, those were all time served. She should have got credit for all time served. And they only gave her 32 days, and on day one, they took 30 of them back. The judge gave her 32 days credit. And the prison took 30 of them back, day one. You know how they did it? It's very simple. The guards get you out of the police car to walk you to the prison door, and you're chained and you're shackled with your hands behind your back. And they, two big male guards reach under a woman's arm and grab her by the back of the arm, like that, on each side. And they start walking her. And they all they have to do, if they want to take away your jail time, your credit, is they squeeze. And that person goes, you're hurting me, you're hurting me, you're hurting me. And they just keep squeezing harder and harder and harder. Until the point where they jerk their arm away. And they jerked, Bonnie jerked her arm away after saying three times, you're hurting me. The big guard put his hand on the back of her head and pushed her to the pavement. And she had to lift her head, land on her chest to stop the fall because her hands are back here and her legs are shackled. So you're just falling. You can't do nothing about it. And then they write you up. And then they write you up and it goes to a hearing and the guard testifies and you don't get to say a damn thing because you're a prisoner. You have no rights. You don't get to say anything in your own defense. And then somebody makes a decision. The Sixth Amendment Speedy Trial Clause protects the presumptively innocent from long-enduring criminal charges. 
the violations for speedy trial rights is dismissal of the charges. It's an administrative thing. You don't even have to go to a hearing. They're supposed to dismiss the charges if they violated your speedy rights, trial rights. Now, most people, they talk you into consenting to not have a speedy trial. And they do. They, they, here's how they do it. The prosecutor asks for an extension of time. And you say, okay. Or you ask for an extension of time. And they say, okay. As soon as that happens, they don't need to provide you with a speedy trial. And you can sit there for a couple of years waiting for trial. What? If you don't stop that in its tracks right then and there or no to, but if you do, and they violate your speedy trial rights, it's an automatic dismissal of the case. It's a violation of the rights of the prosecution. The prosecutor must dismiss the case. Also, it takes a little letter, send it over to the prosecution's office. Dismiss this case. You violated a speedy trial. Well, what is speedy trial? What is it? According to the Speedy Trial Act of 1974, no more than 70 days can pass between indictment and trial. No more than 70 days. And that is codified in Title 18 USC 3161 C1. And it is the prosecutor's duty to dismiss the charges. Betterman versus Montana created the Speedy Trial Act of 1974 and the codification under 18 U.S.C. 3161 gave effect to the Sixth Amendment. U.S. 3161 gave effect to the Sixth Amendment and have muted much litigation about speedy trial requirements. In other words, you don't have to go litigate it. Just send them a letter saying you're screwed. Here's Betterman versus Montana. Do that as judicial notice? Yeah. Yeah. No more than 30 days between arrest and indictment. Boy, that's a big one. Cop arrests you out here today, you got 30 days to get indicted. If the grand jury does an indictment, send him a letter. Dismiss my case. Betterman versus Montana. No more than 70 days can pass between indictment and trial. That's big, guys. A long time ago, I wrote this notice and warning to all agents and officers of any de facto government entity and agency. Last week, I don't know how many people see this crap once I put it out there. Last week, three phone calls. David, that notice of yours? I go, which one was that? <laughs> they tell me. He goes, that stopped it all in his tracks. This is another notice you can give to police, to whatever. Okay. Here, here's the other, what's that? Yeah, it can be used as a judicial notice, but this goes to like police, CPS workers, IRS agents, whatever. Okay. So here's the notices that I put in. This is my own case from the desk of, right? Creator's name always goes to the top. Court comes way down here. <clears throat> This is a notice of violation of fraud upon the court, piracy and capital felony treason against a living man. And I put it in as a judicial notice. This one's about four pages. This is a notice of waiver of judicial immunity. I'm telling them that they waive their immunity 
Well, they violate my rights. Setting them up at the window, big time. This is a notice of violation of Foreign Agent Registration Act. Have I got it through in 35 years to the American people how big a deal the Foreign Agent Registration Act is? It's a big deal. The bar are foreign agents to the people. Put them on notice. They're not registered, I can tell you that. It's an automatic dismissal of cases. <clears throat> Notice of personal violations of unalienable human rights. You file these six things in your case. Oops, where is it? These six things in your case, including the Gorsuch letter. So there's one, two, three, four, five notices that I created. And the Gorsuch letter has your sixth notice. And you can take that to any higher court and win. Any higher court and win. I got Bonnie's case abated. Understand what that means at the 10th Court of Appeals. On August the 3rd, she had a hearing at the lower court and she won the five questions that, they, that the 10th Court of Appeals had to make the lower court answer these five questions. And if they didn't, she was to be released. And the next morning she was released and then rearrested under a whole different name, like a different prisoner. But these are probably f f the, some of the most powerful documents there is. Uh, Adam, come here, would you? That was the cutest tennis shoes I ever saw, man. Thank you, Isn't he a classy guy? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, just generic him. We will. Okay. Thank you. All right. It'll be on Freeman Box, so if anybody needs it, it's there. Thank you. All right. I'll be handing more all weekend, so. All right. Yeah, don't call them in the next hour and say, hey, have you got that up there yet? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me how fast that happens. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you guys made yourself familiar with the U.S. code yet? Okay. Just remember, it's for to us to use against them. It's your friend. Okay. They'll make it your enemy if you leave it up to them, but it's your friend if you don't. All right. When you get a chance, would you do me two favors? You have to go to the car. Oh, it's in the silver box. Okay, never mind. Not today then. Okay, the other one was oh, a set of my name change documents. Okay, thank you. I'll tell you what, with, without people like her helping me, there's no way one man can do this themselves. I generated rubber made container boxes full of documents for Bonnie. And you have no idea how many courts 
and entire attorneys firms are telling me they can't do that. They work in one quarter at a time. Would you measure it by gallons at that point? <laughs> we should, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Gorsuch's notice is inside of all those packets because we want the cops to have them. Yeah, they they might not even you know the, any police officers in the room. I hope so. Any former? Okay, good. One. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> any undercover? Any FBI? I love it when police officers and FBI agents come to the class yeah. to learn yeah. and not for nefarious purposes. If they're here to learn, I welcome them. I welcome judges. We had a we had a uh, Missouri State Supreme Court justice and his whole security team and a woman from the recorder's office or the uh, clerk's office in his court all come to the 1776 event in in the Gaylord. Yeah. It was a very good thing. We didn't know it at the time and I didn't get to spend time with him, which I wish I could have, but it has become a very, very good thing for the state of Missouri that he went. I wish our law enforcement knew law. I would give anything. I, I thought at one time I could change it from the inside and uh, both my wife and I became a disuse county sheriff deputy. We joined the posse first. We did all the training and got to drive the skid cars and, you know, go on rescues up in the mountains and do the pistol shoots with all the other agencies and uh, showed them I could beat them. It was kind of fun. <laughs> and we had such a good time, but I thought I could change it from the inside out because I had a great sheriff. His name was Les Stiles. He passed away last year and he was a great man. And uh, Les wanted it to change. Here he is, the sheriff, and he wants it to, wanted it to change from the inside. You can't change it from the inside. Only we the people can change it. So. Anyway, all right, this packet is part of what you'll be able to go download on the, on the website on straight events for free because you came to the seminar. We're going to start into this and that's all I'm going to focus on tomorrow mainly. But there's been a big piece of the puzzle missing from us that has made it very, very hard to accomplish our end goal, our state goal. And it's been very hard to accomplish that because we were missing a vital function. A man in Texas another David, by the way, he, uh, he got a copy of a document from out of Texas that had his birth certificate long form on it. And then it had his death on the last day of his seventh year. And then it had a little bit more information. And I said, what the heck is this? Now, how long have I been teaching the SESQ Trust Act and that you're presumed dead after seven years until you should return and claim your minor estate, right? I gave that speech at the Hague seven or so years ago, eight years ago. I don't know where it was now. I can't even remember. The story of a mother, right? Well, 
I looked at my my birth certificate and I had my birth certificate on bond paper. This isn't it on bond paper. And I was looking at it real carefully and I saw that it looked like somebody had held a piece of paper over it and you could just see the top of the next line of letters. And I went, huh, I got an incomplete document here. And I had had it authenticated. And it was a long form birth certificate. And I thought, this is an incomplete document. What's the rest say? And then I saw David's document. And I went, holy crap, it's my death. <laughs> I'm a dead man. So I started reading in the law, and back in 2009, I found where they talked about uh, through the Social Security laws that they changed it, your certification of death was under an affidavit of death where somebody actually swore under the pains and penalties of perjury that you passed away and were presumed dead. The body had not been found. And that's what was on everybody's certificates prior to 2009. In 2009, a law changed and I found that law and it said it's a certification of presumption of death. They're no longer swearing to it. They're just certifying it. Okay, you got to understand the difference between those two things. Okay. One is lawful and one is legal. Certification is legal. It's not lawful. All right. So there's this big thing out there. And it's a presumption of your death. So Miranda's getting the papers out, but I, uh, well, she's looking for them. I uh, went through this whole thing. I got to, I got to study this further thing. Kiki had did a pretty good job on a lot of it, and bless her heart for that. Give credit where credit's due. But she didn't have my 35 years experience. And some things just weren't adding up in my head. And I was in, had this turmoil and this doubt for several months because it wasn't making sense. And the two areas it wasn't really making sense was, and I recognized right off, one was she doesn't understand our court system the way I do. She doesn't, she's, she understands courts. She's good with judges. Very good. She's smart. She picks up on their wording better than me. She's very intelligent. But she doesn't understand it the way I do. See? See, I know there's two types of courts. There's Article Three courts with all the authority of the American people because we gave it to our legislators and our legislators created it under the Constitution and their constitutional courts of record. And if we use them properly, they have to do the right thing. And then we have all these other <laughs> bullshit inferior courts, which are all of our state courts. There is no Article Three courts in the state. They're all SMU until they become common law courts or chancery courts in those states. That's going to be the difference. Okay? But under Admiralty, they're all bullshit. And they have no authority over any crime. And our state Supreme Court says it over and over and over again. And you can find it in all of these manuals. In fact, what did I just do with that page I saw a minute ago? Heck, I'll spend more time looking for it than it's worth, probably. So, idiot that I am, 
but I have this ability to read and read fast, started diving into things and I started reading every one of our agencies manuals, policy manuals. I went back and I read, reread the Mason manuals. Remember me talking about Mason manuals? What does our country run under? Our legislature runs under the Mason's Manual for Legislative Procedures. Our judiciary runs under the Mason Manual for Judiciary Procedures. Our administrative branch runs under the Mason Manual for Administrative Procedures. All under the District of Columbia laws. Okay, got a no hierarchy of law. And then you got the UCMJ out here, right? Because when was that adopted? 1775. A year before the Declaration of Independence, we had the Uniform Code of Military Justice with the Grand Army of the Republic in charge of the country. And they still are. The Navy was created that year. The Marines were created that year. The Air Force came later out of the Army, but it was the Army, the Navy, and the Marines were all created in 1775 under the UCMJ, and that predated the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, and predated all of it. So who's really in charge? The military. And then remember who George Washington was. Why did he ride a white horse into battle? The king presented him, the king of England presented George Washington with a white horse to ride into the battle because it's a white flag. Don't shoot the man on the white horse is what the British soldiers were told. You don't shoot the man on the white horse. I mean, they could have been firing cannons and guns on both sides and him right, right through the middle, not get hit. Why? Why didn't the British want to kill our greatest general? Because he was a British general. He worked both sides of the fence. That's why the Washington Monument is the... <laughs> Right. And a Mason. It's all the reasons why is how our country was founded it that way. And he became the first president of the United States of America. People have to read history and know history and understand history. Go read the letters and journals. That's where the real history is. It isn't in textbooks where it's been rewritten for whatever agenda they wanted to do. Read the letters and journals of people who lived during the time that tells you where true history and what happened. Okay. Lincoln said he would fight for the Union and make sure the Union won whether the slaves were freed or not that he would fight for the Union and win whether the slaves were held captive or not. It didn't matter to him one way or the other. And look at what he's credited for. So, <clears throat> under the DHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, which holds all of our birth certificates, which are all traded by the DTCC, that is the brokerage division that holds all the bonds in your Sestake Trust under your birth certificate for the DHHS who holds the paper. They hold your birth certificates. They hold the paper, they hold the bond, DTCC trades on that. And, uh, thank you.
that holds the property, the asset of the chattel property, you, through your birth certificate, the cattle. That's why Bill Clinton took out an agricultural loan on you. He pledged all the men and women with arms and legs. And he took out an ag loan and he filed a UCC1 financing statement on it. And that's easily findable. <clears throat> and so under this new system, they have a computer program. And that computer program, their goal is to ensure consistency. Now, what do I mean by the consistency? The federal government with the Department of Health and Human Services is based in Atlanta, Georgia, and they hold all these records. But where'd those records come from? They were sent there by the 50 states, Department of Health and Human Services, who also keeps a record because there's multiple people along the way that have to get paid. The feds have to get paid out of your trust. The states have to get paid out of your trust. And the counties have to get paid out of your trust because it's run through the county court system, through the Chris system. Under the GSA program, the states get paid from the federal courts. So it took years for me to follow the money, okay? And as you do this and work your way along, you have the counties who gather all the records. What I mean by that is from the coroner, county coroners, your vital statistics records from your hospitals, your doctors, your midwives, your, your abortion clinics, all those guys. Wait till we get into fetal death tomorrow and what that does. And what we found on that just It is because she's smiling because she knows it has become very painful for me. And my blood boils because of it. In fact, every police officer calling themselves in their heart law enforcement officers to serve and protect this nation ought to be turning the tide and stop writing tickets and they ought to be going after these people. And we're going to need them. Don't insult them. Educate them. Once they learn the truth and the real law, educate them. Well, I went in and I spent, locked myself away for a while. And I read and I read and I read and I read. And Miranda read and read and read and read and studied and studied. And she studied different stuff than I studied. And we put all of our things together and we learned from and I'll tell you what, the amount we learned was incredible, wasn't it, Miranda? We read policy manuals like you wouldn't believe. We read employee manuals of all the agencies teaching us what their employees are supposed to do. And we started picking out keywords and putting those keywords together. And we started finding out. Somebody trying to talk to me? No? Okay. Just keep hearing a sound over there. And Jerry helped on quite a bit of this stuff. Thank you. Appreciate you. That man's really good. And we had others helping too. Oh, quite a few others. And I started just digesting it all, putting it in my brain and figuring this stuff out and reading all these manuals. And I'm talking manuals you ever heard of. We're, I was looking for that one page that uh, has a list of manuals on there. You, you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, the CDC's page. You probably, it's right here, right? You want to find it for me real quick? I'll just read off some of the manuals to you that we read. It's crazy. Everything from the United States Post Office everything from the united states postal service i'm telling you she's worth her weight in gold sometimes and other times we fight like cousins 
but I love her. <laughs> so we read the medical examiner's and coroner's handbook on death registration and fetal death reporting. We read the physician's handbook on medical certification of death. The funeral director's handbook on death registration and fetal death reporting. Guidelines for reporting occupation and industry on death certificates. Handbook on the reporting of induced termination of pregnancy. Handbook on marriage registration and handbook on divorce registration because it goes right along with it. And that's just the CDC ones. I guarantee you in the last few months I've read 200,000 plus pages. Thank you. Not a fun job. But I, I'm telling you what we're putting together and we're compiling is so many clues and pieces of the puzzle and the puzzle's getting clearer and clearer and clearer and we're finding shortcuts things that will help us all things that we can make simple from all this mess of crap <laughs> To ensure consistency in the NVSS, the NVSS is their computer server system, whatever. Don't ask me to figure it out. They provide leadership and coordination, the NCHS, through to ensure consistency in the NVSS, their computer system, the NCHS provides leadership and coordination in the development of a standard certificate of death for the states to use as a model. The standard certificate is revised periodically to ensure that the data collected relates to current and anticipated needs. In the revision process, stakeholders pay close attention to the word stakeholders. Who are these guys? People like the Gates Foundation, the Soros Foundation, the, who own the WEF, who own the CDC, who own all these things that are coming down to this one world government. They're the stakeholders. How would you like it if one table full of stakeholders controlled all your health, medical, food supply, water, whether you're alive or whether you're dead, how much money, the entire bond market, every court system, everything. <clears throat> Hell, they buy off all the politicians. They own the politicians. They run all the police departments. And the co police don't know that. They're good men and women. <laughs> Probably not the one you're sitting at. <laughs> And the stakeholders own and control all that. They control all the hospitals, all the medical associations, the National Association of Medical Examiners, the Colleges of American Pathologists, and the American Hospital uh, Associations. These are all stakeholders as well. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of P Pediatricians and Obstetricians, the American and gynecologists, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers for Maternal and Child Health Affiliates, the American Medical Association, and the American College of Nurse Midwives. Every one of their retirement funds of all those people who work for all those agencies is a foundation of stakeholders that are controlling the WHO, the CDC, the DHHS, who holds all your assets, and you're traded through the DTCC, which is their brokers, and they're run through our courts, through our police officers who go out and are told to write tickets and create a cause of action. And that cause of action creates a case number, and that case number creates a CUSIP, and that CUSIP is a 
investment control number attached to a bond regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission and sold under the court clerk's ISILN number, which you can look up on martindale.com, and you can get these judges and the prosecutors and the court clerks and the county treasurers and the mayor of your city, it's ISILN number, and you can take your court case, find the CUSIP, see which bond fund they invested a bond taken out in your name on, and you could find out if it's invested in a prison bond fund or a municipal bond fund, and you could follow the money. And that's how the officers ultimately get paid. I love to roll down my window and my first question out of my mouth is officer hey do you know how you get paid and they say um well, i think property taxes and i bust out laughing i say no here i followed the money here's how it works and i tell them and they go yeah thanks for telling me that it might change my outlook well i hope it does <laughs> <laughs> I hope it does. I need them on our side, you guys. Not against us. They got guns. And they know how to use them. And we need guys with guns who know how to use them. I guess for all you military age men, 17 to 65. Confidentiality of vital records. Oh, this pisses me off. They have passed acts of Congress and legislation and statute on how to keep their documents that are ours from us. Oh, it's making me mad. It's making me mad. She brought my original raised seals. See, there's three seals. That's an exemplification. That means the judge signed the order and the court clerk verified the judge's signature. And then the judge verified the court clerk's signature <laughs> and certified that Honorable Judge Matthew Galley change the name and this is the general judgment and order changing david lester straight to david lester straight upper and lower case david lester straight all caps but it did more than that because if you go to the applications it has my paternal DNA sequencing right back to Adam. There's Adam's name right at the bottom of the list. And then it has my maternal DNA sequencing all the way back to Eve. And then my fingerprints with my date of birth are attached. What does the cops do first thing? Okay. And that's got my signature on it. It's filled out on the federal form, fingerprint form that's used everywhere. FBI, everywhere. And then it's got the application that I made for the name change. And then it's got a copy of my hospital certificate. It's got a copy of my long form birth certificate from California. And it's got one page of my names. There's
there's about 70 on that line, 75 on each of these lines. That's uh, 220 names, variations of mine. And they could have arrested you in any one of those names. Why would you? No, they can't. Once you get a court order name change, they can call you nothing but that one. Okay. Now, Bonnie, because she'd been married a few times and women tend to change her last name, and then that complicates the mathematical outlook, like winning the lottery. She had 10 pages of names. So after I went through the course and I got rid of six of her names, I'm thinking I might be here for 100 years trying to work through all of her names, which is crazy. So th thank you. Now, for each of your names, like your all caps name, Latin term, what does it mean when your name is in all caps? A diminishing or abridgment of personality. Okay. A loss or curtailment of a man's status. Or any aggregate of legal attributes and qualifications falling upon certain changes in a civil condition. Capitus diminutio maxima. The high is the highest or most comprehensive loss of status. Okay. This occurred when a man's condition was changed from one of freedom to one of bondage. When he became a slave, is swept away with it all of his rights. Just by the use of your capital name, you swept away all of your rights. What was the Latin term? <laughs> I said it once, and I, go, I, I said to myself inside, as I was saying that, my mind does weird things when I'm talking, and I said to myself inside, well, by God, you actually got it out of your freaking mouth. <laughs> And now you want me to say it again. The odds of it happening correctly twice in a row, not good. Look it up. <laughs> All right, that was fun. 20 CFR section 404.722. Rebuttal of presumption of death. It's codified. Right? 20 CFR section 404.722. Rebuttal of presumption of death. I just printed this right off of the website. Let's see. A presumption is made based on section 404.721B can be rebutted by evidence. See, when they blue line stuff or make things blue, you can click on those hyperlinks and by evidence, also blue, okay, so you can see what those mean. I recommend doing that. That establishes that the person is still alive or explains the individual's absence in a matter consistent with continued life rather than death. Example one, evidence that a claim for surviving child's benefits showed that the worker had wages posted to his earnings record in the year following the disappearance. It was established that the wages belonged to the worker and were for work done after his disappearance. In this situation, the presumption of death is rebutted by evidence, wages belonging to the worker that the person is still alive after 
he had disappeared. Yeah, what did we find out on that, Miranda? 12 months, if you're a federal employee and you've disappeared for 12 months, you're presumed dead. 12 months. Isn't that funny? Oh, the shit they come up with. So evidence, B, evidence, evidence about your adaptive functioning may come from medical sources. So you can get a, a doctor to say, hey, he's alive. You can get a coroner to say, hey, he's not dead. <laughs> okay. Anyway, these are things, school records, school uh, employers, supervisors, your own statements about you handle your daily activities. You could write an affidavit of things you've done in your daily activities and prove that you're alive. Now, what the hell you do with it once you've done that? If you look in Bonnie's 10th uh, Court of Appeals case, I filed all of her name change documents with all of her DNA, with her hair, with her nails, with stamps, U USPO stamps. And I not only tied her body to her name, but created evidence that she's alive because when they, when the 10th Court of Appeals did their thing to get her back into the trial court. They sent an order to the trial court to put out a warrant to exhume the body from prison. Oh yeah, see they dispose of the case, the, the trial court disposes of the body, sends it to the morgue, that's prison. And if they want to get it back, they have to exhume the body all a little morbid, right? But that's what they do. And you're, even though you're alive, breathing, talking on the phone, you're presumed dead. So it's called a corpius warrant. Exhume the corpse. Bring it out of prison for trial. Well, a habeas corpus to get you out of jail. If they've done you wrong, it, sh it should be easy. And that's the thing. Bonnie wrote a habeas corpus. We submitted in the Northern District Court. It was denied. We went back and rebutted, got, asked for another judge. That was denied. denied. Denied, 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 denied. She wrote the same document for five other women in prison while she was there, and they all got out. But not her. Same document, same habeas corpus. Why do it work for five? And not one. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of reasons for stamps. Goes clear back to the Stamp Act in the 1800s. And if you place stamps on a writ, you're paying the stamp tax for a writ and it can't be denied. If you don't pay the stamp tax and show that you've purchased stamps from the United States Post Office, they can deny the writ. So much we don't know. Form 4, or official Form 205, is an involuntary petition against a non-individual. I want you to write that down. Look that up, study that. It identifies a debtor. And who is the debtor? The debtor is the United States Corporation, whatever that's called, whatever, whatever uh, <clears throat> Dun & Bradstreet number it happens to have, it's corporate number, they're the debtor. You can you put down other names the debtor has used in the last eight years, like the White House Office Inc., U.S. Inc., USA Inc., 
All debtors. You can list all those. What's that? Form 205. Then you can get a hold of the IRS and get their uh, employer identification number. Put the debtor's address on there and mailing address, their physical and mailing address. And go use it against them. <laughs> the United States is a corporation. The White House Office Inc. is a corporation. The state of Oklahoma is a corporation. The county of whatever this is is a corporation. The city of is a corporation. The police department in the city of is a corporation. So is the dog catcher. And because they're all private, for-profit corporations acting and pretending to be government, that's key, acting and pretending to be government under color of law. Fraud. Fraud. It's a fallacy. It's fraud. There's no statute of limitations on it. She's exactly right. Now go put in your judicial notices and start holding them accountable. Now your names. I'll, I'll get this. I'm, I'm just going to read a few of these off. I'm not going to go through the whole darn thing. Plus it's a terrible copy. I can barely read it. Came from a photograph. Yeah. No, I, it's big enough. <laughs> United States Code. These are all United States Codes. So I'm going to read a few of the important ones. 15, Title 15, United States Code, 1600G. You know what that code's about? We are the creditors. Title 15, 2331 is the definitions of terrorism and nationals of the U.S. U.S. nationals, not American state nationals. 2331, 15, 2331. 28, 2007, imprisonment for debt is abolished. Now, every single person that goes to prison in an inferior court is there for a debt, and there is no debtor's prisons. So why are they going to prison? They're all a debtor. And I'm going to tell you something right here on that that makes me sick to my stomach. So the county brought these two old misdemeanors that had already been adjudicated and dropped against me. And they put them up and put out a warrant. And the county clerk puts on a little charge for $50. What the hell is that for? I don't know. Paper? I don't know. No explanation for the charge, no nothing. $50, you owe a debt of $50. So I thought, uh-huh, I think there's something fishy going on here. I'm going to find out what it is. So it says pay online. I hit the button, pay online. It says put in your credit card information. Put in my credit card information. It says to continue. I know they have to by law, banking law, verify the debt before you finalize it right so it was okay went ahead and put my credit card information i hit continue and then i did what no other american on earth ever does i read all the fine print <laughs> read the fine print the fine print says by paying this fee 
you waive all your rights, you agree to this plea deal, you are guilty, and we can come over to your house, pick you up, throw you in jail for any prison sentence that we see fit, you've signed your plea deal. And I'm giving you the short version. They had a whole paragraph there about everything that they just did to you. And it's right there on it because you paid a $50 fee because you thought you owed a bill. And they don't even have to take you to court. You've waived all your due process. You've waived all your rights. You're guilty. You plead guilty right there by paying the $50 fine. And it's done, it's over with. And then I said, is it only in my criminal county? Is that, is these guys doing it? Are they that crooked? So I started calling people I knew had prison cases. I said, hey, do you mind if I look up your case number? And I found a few with the fees. So I put my credit card information. <laughs> and the damn statements on every one of them all across this country. And I'm thinking to myself, the prison is full of people who just paid their bill. And they did it without a trial, without any due process, without the assistance of counsel, without putting able to put on witnesses or put on evidence or question their accuser. <clears throat> we'll get rid of that cramp pretty fast. All I gotta do is sit on it for a minute. It goes away. It's my back pinching my ribs, pinching a nerve, getting a cramp. All right. False representation. What if I told you there was a United States code that says it couldn't repossess your car for clothes on your house? Yeah. Title 15, 1692F. No repo or foreclosure. I said, make it your friend. 18, 1001. Fraud, prison charges and fines for all branches of government. Forty two, nineteen eighty six, action for neglect to prevent. You know what that means? That means when a police officer neglects to prevent you, to prevent your injury, such as coming over your house and helping the thief steal your stuff. That becomes a problem for them. Title 15, Section 1 is a trust penalty of $100 million for illegal activity of breach of fiduciary. Not one person in here smiled with a big grin like I was expecting on that one. I mean, I stopped, paused, and looked at all your faces. Uh, he started smiling, but it was a slow grin. It was one of those. <laughs> Which one? Oh. No. <laughs> Do you know when a police officer fails to identify himself to you? That that's a crime? Yes. 
I like this one. Title 15, 1662B. Cash is not required for credit transactions. <laughs> I've talked about the coffee bean case before. You remember that? Yeah. They cannot tell you what species to pay in. <laughs> so if you try and force them to commit to a species and they decline, pay them with coffee beans. You know, $1,100, send them 1,100 coffee beans. It's a commodity. It's got value. They can go in the back and make a pot. How about one of my favorites, Title 15, 1666B. This one ought to help you all. There is no such thing as late payments. No such thing as late payments. Well, they don't tell you nothing, do they? <laughs> if you got late payments on your credit report, just send them over that U.S. code and say, ha! Ah. <laughs> and they'll have to remove all your late payments. Your credit score goes up. Lots of ways to protect ourselves. Copyrights, trademarks, utility patents, and design patents. Patent in our name, patent our DNA, patent our everything. We can trademark it all. They let me out of jail the first time and wiped my record off the county records because I said, did you know? This is when the judge was arraigning me, right? I said, Your Honor, did you know the name that you're using is trademarked? And you can't use it? <laughs> yeah. It hurts them sometimes badly. Okay, I think I've gone through that. So the girl that got fired as a policeman and with no training went out to be a policeman with a gun on her side. Did she know that she had to identify herself on the side? I don't know if she knows anything. I don't even know if she knows how to drive the car. <laughs> Oh, what's that? Hey, how about we take a potty break real quick and come back? What time is it? Okay, and then we'll finish up five five thirty or so. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Quick potty break. Ten minutes. You might be able to attend if you want. Well, hey, everybody, let's get sat back down. I don't mind. Are you? Yeah. <clears throat> Either, either, I'm fine. All right.
right, we're going to get started again. Okay, for everybody, this is already online. Katie put it on uh, straightevents.com. If you go to seminar products, seminar products, click on Claremore 2024 updates. Hit add to cart. And then type in promo code DLS more, like Claire Moore, only DLS more. Okay. Straightevents.com, click on seminar products, click on Claire Moore 2024 updates. Go to add to cart, put in promo code DLS more, and you get all this that I'm talking about tomorrow for free. So, all right. Thank you. It's uh, 97 pages of material. <laughs> You're welcome. You have a mind on there where we can uh, give a gift? I don't know. <laughs> huh? I appreciate those. They help out a lot. And they help a lot of other people. So. What is the Social Security Administration? <laughs> I figured that was going to be the most prevalent answer in the room. Didn't they give you guys a raise, you older people, on January 1st? Did it, did it keep up with Biden's inflation? <laughs> I, of course, it's always been a joke. Um, the agency definition in Black's Law, a relation created either by express or implied contract or by law, whereby one party called the principal all right. Sir, is that an M word alert? Yeah. No, wait, this is it. This is it. <laughs> Probably some parent tried to hide their kid from the cops. Relation created by. I know. Do you, do you know? Probably one of the reasons I've been in trouble recently. So when we get an Amber Alert on our phone, we call the Sheriff's Department and we tell them to stop kidnapping the kids. <laughs> Sick and tired of that crap. A relationship created by express or implied contract or by law whereby one party called the principal or con constituent Phew. Don't ask me. Yeah. 
delegates the transaction of some lawful business or the authority to do certain acts for him or in relation to his rights or property with more or less discretionary power to another person called the agent, attorney, proxy, or delegate who undertakes to manage the affair and render him an account thereof. <laughs> It's exactly what the definition of a trust is. The Social Security Administration is a U.S. government agency that administers social programs covering disability, retirement, and survivor's benefits, among other services. It's responsible for issuing Social Security numbers and managing the program's finances and trust fund. They haven't had a trust fund since the 1950s. They've been using a general fund, putting everything in the general fund. So they don't have a trust fund. So I laugh every time Ron Paul gets on stage and says the Social Security is going to be broke. <laughs> they went broke in 1950. And it moved into the general fund. See, the reason they're broke is their trusts, your trusts, aren't held there. <laughs> your trusts aren't held there. They switched it on you. <clears throat> Says the tax revenue goes into two Social Security trust funds, the old age and survivor's insurance trust fund, for retirees and the and the disability insurance trust fund for disability beneficiaries. Well, I got news for you. They both come out of the general fund. All those are is the private insurance policies that they purchased. Because all insurance policies are a trust, as are all bank accounts. Every bank account is a trust account. And if they don't think you manage your trust account and you're in a business of liability, they make you open a trust account under the trust account. <laughs> this, this crap drives me nuts. And the reason it does is because I think in the term of a creditor and not a debtor all the time. So I don't go into a bank and make deposits. It's what other people do. I have posits made in an account. And it shows up as a negative because it's sitting there inactive. And then when you activate it, it shows up as a positive and it discharges the debt that's paid. There is a big, big, big difference. And you can get credit cards based on that trust account. Where it just pays American Express. But actually in a way that discharges the debt. And it's all bass backwards. <laughs> the difference is where the negative sign is put. And that's the only difference. When you read through the Social Security stuff, you got to read it really slow. And you got to go over it in your mind a few times. <clears throat> Look at their reference. When they reference Section 205 of 42 U.S.C. 405, and they reference that, read that code as well. Because it will give you an explanation that might clarify things for you. <laughs> Nap. 
N-A-P-H-S-I-S. N-A-P-H-S-I-S. They held their annual meeting in 2024 on May the 20th of this year is going to be their annual meeting in Detroit, Michigan. And one of their, their slogans is, life happens. <laughs> right underneath that, it says, when someone is born, dies, gets married, or gets divorced in the United States, official information called vital records are documented by NAFSIS, members who work in state vital records and public health statistics offices. Oh my gosh. So, in studying this, I'm going to shift, I'm letting my blood cool off. I'm even cooling it down with some tea because I'm getting very, very pissed just thinking about what I'm about to tell you. This one world government bullcrap Napsis is their computer system company, private company, who puts their employees inside of all your DHHS offices, medical facilities, and so on and so forth. Do you know how old Napsis is? It's been around since 1933. Formed in 1933, NAPSIS brings together public health professionals from 57 jurisdictions representing all 50 states and the five U.S. territories, New York City. I wonder why they said that. And the District of Columbia, the two nation states. New York City is a, a United Nations nation state. When, when Rudy Giuliani got up on stage as mayor of New York, and they said, hey, can you get these guys to pay the millions of dollars of traffic and parking tickets? And he says, no, I don't control that. I'm just the mayor of New York. <laughs> he was the mayor of New York City. That's the United Nations. Is New York City is defined in the United Na in the United States Code as the United Nations. Is it all five boroughs or just Manhattan? All of it. Not at all, huh? <clears throat> NAFSIS's partners. Who had the glasses? I'm gonna borrow your glasses again. Oh yeah, right. That's all right. I'm just stealing them whether you want it or not. <laughs> Their partners are the Social Security Administration. PHAB, which is a public health, per, advancing public health performance. Whew. The CDC. The AAMVA, the APHL, Vital Check, Ancestry.com's a partner, oh. AWS, Axial, Ruvos, Webflow, So what do they do? They own two big supercomputers at the University of Texas in Austin that keep track of all medical records of all the people of the world. Now, remember, some of those aboriginal tribes have no records. They have no nothing. They have no government. They have nothing. They're the only free men and women on the planet. <laughs> yeah. 
and, and Mennonites and Amish don't for a minute think their records aren't being tracked because they are <laughs> not supposed to be don't tell them but they are <laughs> but these guys control all the medical records that control all the vital statistics that's kept track of so they know how many people live and how many people die and how many people they can kill off at whim and that's what they're doing that's your new flow chart for your one world government aren't we proud they trick us into applying for benefits with the ss5 social security now if you look at that picture carefully you can see that it continued right look at your birth certificate it continues miranda left somewhere but there's 54 boxes on your birth certificate you don't have them all not even on your long form because you're missing the section on your death Your nine digit social security number is composed of three parts. The area number, the group number, and the final uh, set of four digits is the serial number. You cannot, now this is in their manual, you cannot receive social security benefits without being a public officer. <laughs> it was a public officer's employee benefit program, the retirement plan. They just got you under the 14th Amendment to be a U.S. citizen and under the 13th Amendment to be a slave. And then. They made you all public officers by your own consent. Started with your birth. And every time you give consent, you're a public officer, public employee. The United States Code only applies to public employees. So unless you rebut that you're a public employee, well, then they can charge you under the United States Code for a crime of fraud. just because you're a public employee. As a co-trustee in the welfare fund, they now transferred you as the asset. They transferred you as the asset. Anybody that owns a business knows that employees are their asset. Because without them, no work would get done, right? It's all about our labor, our energy. Everything is. Twenty six U.S. Code Section seven seven zero one under definitions when used in this title were not otherwise distinctly expressed or manifestly incompatible with the intent thereof. A person or the term person shall be construed to mean and include an individual trust, estate, partnership, association, company or corporation. Did you hear man or woman? No. Son or daughter of God? No. Living soul? No. What does the Bible tell us, Job? 32, 21, and 22? Be the man and not the person. Don't put fat, flattering titles of person upon a man, for if you do, it's a sin and it'll surely take you away. Say, we can't accept any man's person. Can't accept it. Mm -hmm. 
Fiduciary. The term fiduciary means a guardian, trustee, executor, administrator, receiver, conservator, or any person acting in any fiduciary capacity for any other person. <clears throat> so if you have to go in court, you put your all caps name up there because that's what they do. And you say, David Lester, by, by, colon, David Lester, straight up or lowercase, is agent, acting as agent for David Lester Strait as a beneficiary of the trust. Then you're the agent acting as beneficiary. So. Under this code, United States, the term United States, when used in a geographical sense, includes only the states and the District of Columbia. The states and the District of Columbia. How do they spell states, you think? All caps or upper and lower case, but not all lower case. Very important. There is the state, and then there is the state, and then there is the state. Three jurisdictions, land, air, and water. Do you know which is which? Ah. See, without that depth of understanding, that's why great people don't understand what they're doing in name change and equity. They're good people. They're doing the right thing. They've got the right heart, the right intention. They're doing the right thing. They're trying to help people, but they don't understand the courts and they don't understand equity. Even though they know a great deal about equity, they don't understand it and they don't understand jurisdiction. And without those de deep understanding of those basic things, that's your foundation. You got to have a foundation to build upon. When you have the foundation to build upon, understand the courts one more time. We have the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. We have the Supreme Court of the United States. We have 94 district courts, 13 appellate courts, and 36 chancery courts. And everything else is an inferior court. The chancery courts are by themselves. They're the king's courts. They're high courts. They're high courts in equity, high courts in common law. The Article Three courts under the Constitution are federal courts, district courts, and appellate courts. Everything else is an inferior court and has no authority without your consent. <laughs> they got to have two things. They have to have your consent. They have to have a contract. They're inferior courts. They're corporations. The state of Oregon judiciary has 1,600 private for-profit corporations underneath it and it's got a Dun & Bradstreet number and it has 1600 Dun & Bradstreet numbers underneath it for the local county court the district courts all the other courts in the entire state are private for-profit corporations underneath the Oregon State Judiciary which is a private for-profit corporation as a subsidiary of the state of Oregon Corporation, which is a subsidiary of the White House Office Inc., which is a subsidiary of the District of Columbia. And in order for any of them to do business with you, they got to have a contract and they have to have your consent. You can give your consent in a number of ways. 
Hi, officer. Come on in. <laughs> he just gave consent. The term taxpayer means any person subject to any internal revenue tax. That's the term taxpayer. Guess what? I don't meet the definition of a taxpayer. It's kind of cool. I opted out. I told them who the fiduciary was. These people out there are saying the Form 56 is not something you shouldn't do. Well, I just learned from a judge that I should do it not just once for me on my proper name, but I should do it to assign trusteeship to them if I want to. I can take the name in a court case, I can fill out a Form 56, and I can put that judge's name as my fiduciary on a Form 56 instead of the IRS, and he'll get a letter that he's the fiduciary. And I don't have to go in court and say, Judge, you're the trustee, I'm the beneficiary. I just made him one. And I let them enforce it. <laughs> See how cool that is? <laughs> a police officer signs your traffic ticket and you don't. Then make him the trustee, fill out a form 56, make the officer of trustee of the beneficiary, he signed the contract, he has to pay it. <laughs> Fuck him. I'm telling you, I learned so much from talking to this one judge, my head's spinning. He's shown me a hundred ways to use the Form 56. You got a mortgage? Uh, <laughs> Bank the mortgage company, your fiduciary, and they got to make the payments. Can you do it for the corporate? The corporate. Doesn't he have to accept the Ah, does he? Did they sign it? Twenty six US Code seven seven oh one, more definitions. Employee for the purpose of applying the provisions of section seventy nine with respect to group term life insurance produced for purchase for employees for the purpose of applying the provisions of section one oh one, one oh five, one oh six with respect to accident health insurance or accident health plans and for the purpose of applying the provisions of subtitle A. Oh, that's a kind of a cute little thing. With respect to contributions to or under a stock bonus, pension, profit sharing, or annuity plan, and with respect to distributions under such plan, or by a trust forming part of such plan, and for purposes of applying Section 125 with respect to cafeteria plans, the term employee shall include a full-time life insurance salesman who is considered employee for the purpose of Chapter 21. <clears throat> You can make your insurance agent an employee of government. You guys, I know right now you're going, what the hell? I don't even understand. I just don't. But when you read all these other little things that are underlined, when you're going through the manual and you click on them online and you read them, it starts to get really interesting because the Social Security Administration is an insurance company who holds under trust payments you and your employer put in for premiums. And you've got a great big account there. 
<laughs> a great big account there. Are you, is, you have a life insurance plan on yourself? Million dollars? Half a million? Uh, a little higher? Okay. What if I told you you had a hundred million here? <laughs> oh, that's the key. You have to have a hearing. I'm going to teach you guys that you got to have a hearing with the Social Security Administration and rebut the presumption of death and be in full life and take them the evidence or proof. And then you can ask for them to liquidate the account and write you a check. I just did. I just did. You got a lot of money in that account. And it's only part of your trust. But it's an easy piece of the trust to get to. It's going to get good. As we learn more and more and more, we're going to start helping lots and lots of people. Yeah. The repository for all of what you talked about, the documents and stuff like that, where is that? Handball or some other place? Where is it just not in there? Okay, I'm not quite understanding what you said. The documentation. What documentation? What you just read. Where can we get that? I just told you. It's online. Type in the code. Oh, that, it's in that file. Yeah. Oh, I gave you a big bunch of paperwork. <laughs> I gave you all of this plus some. <laughs> I gave you all of this. All of this. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. This is five months, 7,000 7, plus miles, and 15,000 plus dollars, and a lot of, lot of hours. So. And you get it for $150 in your travel expenses. <clears throat> this is all out of their manuals, guys. I didn't write any of this crap. Okay? It's all out of their manuals. It is, it is things that... We took maybe 200,000 pages of material, picked out 100 critical pieces of the puzzle, and gave them to you. Okay? Things you need to know. So when you walk into your hearing, if you learn this stuff, you walk into your hearing, it'll be easy for you. Okay? Like rights and obligations of a fiduciary. You need to understand trust a little bit. Okay? Trust law is very important. Equity law is pretty important. Rebutting the presumption of death, well, that's relatively easy. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what I did with my iPad. It's probably out in the car. <clears throat> this one's cool. Remember what I told you, you're all public officers, especially if you're on Social Security, right? That's not the only thing that makes you a public officer, but that's one of the biggies, right? Well, what happens when you're a public officer? Your residence is now domiciled in the District of Columbia. Yep. And the sure use of your zip code is the proof and evidence of that fact. The proof and the evidence of it. All offices attached to the seat of government 
shall be exercised in the District of Columbia and not elsewhere. Now, I'm about to have some fun with y'all because this is fun for me. Tammy, yes. hey, officer of government, your office is in Claymore, Oklahoma. See, I don't care where it is. I just got her on fraud. That's simple. Because if she's calling herself government, her office is not in Claymore, Oklahoma. And it can't be. Only in the District of Columbia and not elsewhere. Now in here, we, we wrote a document. I wrote it like this here, and there are reasons because we designed these as a slideshow. And I could have pulled that screen down there and that screen down there, hooked up to a computer, sat here and bored you all <laughs> and showed you these on slides. But this is really a document we wrote that's a, a, a notice of conveyance, which turns into the reconveyance of your name regarding your legal name change. So it goes with the name change documents like Miranda got me and I showed you those exemplified documents. So this document goes with that to be submitted. Okay. So I'll give you that too. Um, name change requirements. So every court and we did our name change in Oregon. Uh, every court has their own form for a name change. Now, I've never been big at using their forms. You can take all the information off their form and make it into your own document, or you can use their form. If you're doing it online, their form is easier. Okay. If you're doing it in person, I'd write your own document. That's my recommendation. Okay. So the Social Security Administration has a manual called POMS, a Program Operations Manual. You can download that online. I'm giving a, a lot of the key parts of it to you so you don't have to read the whole freaking thing. <clears throat> There's evidence of your name. Evidence is important. Acceptable name change identification, what you need is in here. And then there's the Social Security Administration presumption of death rebuttal requirements. Now, in this journey I took, through a whole bunch of states, we stopped by a half a dozen or so social security offices. In fact, I'm gonna back up really quick and we'll, we'll get part of this over. <clears throat> I was born in California, Gilroy. I was actually born in a farmhouse in Morgan Hill on 3000 acres. As soon as I was born, my dad rushed my mom to the hospital with me still attached and went to the hospital where I got a birth certificate and a hospital certificate. And they stole my soul with the soul plates and uh, took my blood, beamed me healthy, cut the cord, and I left, went home. I went to the county I was born in, Santa Clara County. Well, Santa Clara County's grown a lot in the last 60 years. And they had brand new offices. So I went to the old county courthouse first because that's what I saw online. Wrong place to go. Talked to a guy on the street. He said, no, no, they just built a whole building complex. I drive over there and there's 20 buildings 
five times bigger than this one. I find, found the right building to walk into and I walk in and you walk up to a window and she says, what the hell are you here for? <laughs> this, this, or this. Uh, take this number, go see that guy. You go see that guy, he tells you where to sit. In. You fill out a form regarding what you're there for. Believe me, you can get married right there. Okay, I watched the guy get, uh, a couple, beautiful young couple, get married at window number 21. <laughs> a very personal, romantic, sworn. Their preacher was literally the clerk. Cracked me up. I've, I watched five weddings in my waiting time. 42 windows. 42 windows of clerks. Okay. I have my long form birth certificate. My number gets called eventually after I watch five weddings. And I walk up the window and I say, I don't know what it's called, but I know what I want. I have this long form birth certificate here and I'm behind glass with a little cutout, right? And the cutout has one of those little dippy things in it. And I says, I have my long form birth certificate here. I've had it authenticated. I've got several copies. This is not what I need. And she goes, well, you marked, you want your birth certificate. I said, no, look at the paper I filled out. I also marked death certificate. <laughs> she looks at me and says, you're alive. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but somebody f screwed up. <laughs> Because I know they declared me dead. I want the one that's on bond paper that has the birth and the death on it. She goes, we don't do that here. We just can give you extra copies of what you want. If you want extra copies, they're $26 a piece. Do you want one of them? No, I don't need any more of those. That's not what I want. I want, I went into the second time, Rule of three, right? One in the second time, and I said, I want the one with the death on it. Well, we don't, we don't do that here. I've never had anybody ask me for that. I've been working here a long time. I said, no, look, you don't understand. I came here to the county in my birth. I drove all the way from Tennessee to California to get a copy of my birth and death record. So let me get my supervisor. She goes, let me, <laughs> let me go get, another lady comes out, I talk to her, I do that three times. Most people would have quit after one time. Now I'm, now I'm through six and she's gonna let me go get my supervisor. So I'm moving up the food chain. She comes out. She says, no, we can only give you the, the, what you have already. You want more copies of what you have already? No, let me, let me say this again. I said, I want the birth and death record. She goes, well, that's confidential. <laughs> you can't get that without a court order name change. I said, oh, good, I've got one. <laughs> She goes, no, we can, you can get more copies of what you have. We don't, we don't do that. That's confidential. And I says, you don't do it or you won't do it or you can't do it because you don't do it here. And she says, no, you have to go to Sacramento. I said, do you happen to have the address and phone number of where I go in Sacramento? And do you happen to know the name of the document I'm describing that I really want? And she says, it's called a certified confidential birth slash death vital statistics record. That's the document you want. <laughs> certified confidential birth slash 
death vital statistics record. That's the name of the document. Okay. And you have to go to Sacramento to get it. This is the address. This is the phone number. You have to talk to this person and they don't accept walk-ins. <laughs> I said, really? They don't, okay, they don't accept walk-ins. So I walked out of there after driving that many miles with nothing. Was that a failure? No. no. That was a win big time. Because yes. <laughs> now I know the name of the document. I know how many times I got to say it, how many people I got to say it to. And I know where I got to go get it. I know what their phone number is. So I start driving north. <laughs> Department of Health and Human Services, California State of Department of Health and Human Services. Now, start driving north we get on the phone to the state department of health and human services work our way through a few people confirm that we needed the court ordered name change wishing i would have known the name of the document and everything before because i would have had when i did the name change i would have had the judge order it and that would have made my life a little easier because their agency you have to do a FOIA request you have to give them a gift yes. governments take gifts did you know that see what they do is this they charge you 26 dollars for the application they charge you 29 dollars for the document one copy I said, what if I want 10 copies? She goes, I wouldn't recommend you order 10 copies, you order one. And then after you get it, send a photocopy of it back with your order for the other nine. And I said, why? She says, because any revenue taken in by the Department of Health and Human Services of the state of California is a gift. So, they're going to send you back the wrong document. They don't want to give you the confidential one. And when you get the, your birth certificate back in the mail, you just lost your $26 and $29 fee. So consider it a gift. That's what the passport agency does too. If you go in there to get your passport and you fail, they keep the money. That was a gift. And you got to pay it all over again. See? So, you do it providing the name change order and FOIA request it as the individual named requesting it. The individual named requesting it. Now, for Bonnie, after a period of phone calls and working our way up, we got to the Attorney General of the state of Texas. And he said, FOIA requests their office, if they don't send you the document you need, call us back and we'll get it for you. He'll make sure he gets it for you. Another thing you can do is when these states don't comply and they're being a pain in the ass, get your legislator involved. So look up who your legislator is in that state. And get them involved and ask for their help and show them proof and evidence that you've done your due diligence, what you're supposed to do in requesting it, and you failed. And that you're the individual named on the report and entitled to it because you've jumped through the hoops. You've got your court order name change. You've jumped through the hoops. You're the individual named and you're entitled to it. 
Very, very important, you guys. We need that document. You know why we need it? Have you figured it out yet? Because when you walk in the Social Security Administration for a hearing, to rebut the presumption of death, you have to have evidence of your death, not only that you're not dead, but you have to declare yourself in full life and you need evidence of life and you have to have more than one evidence. So you can have a statement from yourself. You can have a doctor, physician, AMA medical professional or a coroner say you're alive and have them write it on a prescription pad. Would we actually also have to request the copy of the affidavit that the clerk says to begin with? Well, see, now that's the great idea because, and, and, and this is, I'm glad he brought it up. I was going to tomorrow, okay. but it's okay. <laughs> if we have the document, the evidence is clear that somebody committed fraud. Alive. Now it's an automatic presumption of death and a declaration in full life. And the Social Security Administration office in Baltimore can direct your wife, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, direct your wife and issue you a check for the full amount in the account. But it has to have a hearing. Those are the two things you need to do with the court order name change. Tie in the body <laughs> to the name. Now, some people are having a really hard time in this country getting a court order name change, and these judges aren't going to want to give it. Our best hope is that in those states that are extremely difficult, chancery courts or common law courts, the states that have switched to common law, are going to be doing them. If you're having a hard time getting it out of an admiralty judge. I got mine out of an admiralty judge in a very liberal state, which uh, quite a few people in this room got theirs from the same judge in the same county in Oregon. We have to have an address there. So there's ways to go and establish an address, take, take your documents into court, get the documents sent to the address, get them, send the verification in, you're done. See? You can do that outside of state or the FBI? No, I was sitting in Arkansas when I did mine in Oregon. <laughs> well, here's another thing. You can always get get an address in uh, Tennessee. Go to the Chancery Court. What did I read you off their website? <laughs> so, yeah. What? No. Okay. Let me tell you how why you don't have to start all over if you've already done your name change under other people's methods because their methods aren't wrong they're not wrong they're just incomplete so what you do i recommend a blank fingerprint card and we can get those to you we had to go to friendly gun dealers get the card take their name out digitize it now we have it on computer and it's the federal form. Put your fingerprints on there. Notice mine were in purple on my original. I actually showed you my original, so that's interesting. And do your fingerprints, make sure your birth date's on there and the top's filled out properly. I recommend attaching your DNA. If you don't have your DNA sequencing done, which you can get through CGI, out of Utah, pretty reasonable. CGI. In fact, they ran a uh, Black Friday special, dropped it all the way down to 55 bucks for a week for Black Friday. I've never seen it that low. It's usually a couple hundred bucks. And you can get your DNA sequencing, and it looks just like mine with the hapo all the way back. Now, 
There's a difference between men and women. Men, it's easy. Done deal. Women, you're get one half. Ask for both halves. One half knowing that it's going to be somewhat accurate. But not perfect. Okay. But women will have one side that's completely accurate. Attach your DNA. Okay. Your DNA can be hair, pull out 10 strands of hair with follicle, cut it a little bit shorter, clip your nail. You know why? You know why we clip our nail? Because the Bible says our bones contain our life DNA. Everything is produced in the spinal column. And our bones contain our DNA and our nails are bone. So clip your hair and your nail and attach it to your fingerprint card or a, a affidavit sheet. Bonnie, I told her to write a little thing. Oh my gosh, she's brilliant sometimes. And she wrote a very brilliant statement with her hair and nail put it under a postage stamp, so the nail's sticking out under the postage stamp, put her hair under it, put her fingerprints on it, and send it to me. Now I take that, or the DNA I got from CGI on mine, or C, yeah, and put it with the name change and go record it, publicly publish it, and then it becomes part of the document. That's how you add it to it after the fact. Okay. It would have been easier had you and I known a little bit more before we did it, because then we could have did it all at once. We could have requested a, a court order for the certified confidential birth, death, vital statistics record, and got it all done at one time. Same name for each state that, that document? Huh? It's worldwide universal. Okay. It's all centralized under NAPSIS and the DHHS. See, there's DHHS is in the county. Those are responsible for gathering the information from all the hospitals, corners, whatever. They take it, they send it off to the state. For doing the work, they get paid by the state. The state does the work, holds the records for the entire state, and they get paid by the federal government when they send it to Atlanta, to DHHS. It's all the same crap, county, state, federal, three jurisdictions, all the same thing, and it becomes a checks and balances system for them. So that the same information is universal, and they keep all those records, attach your birth certificates to it, which come from each state. That becomes the bond, and DHHS holds the bond paper on all the chattel property, and that bond is issued to the DTCC, who is the broker, who sells it on Wall Street and trades you, buys and trades you, and builds up your account for you as the beneficiary. Does that make sense? That's all under the SESTIQ Trust. Well, now the DHHS is controlled by the CDC, which is controlled by the WHO, which is controlled by its stakeholders, using stakeholders as the people who run the computer system, and they're all private for-profit corporations created one world government. They went to the politicians and says, hey, you guys don't matter anymore. You keep the people entertained. You keep them fighting amongst parties, who's president, who's not president, what bills. You control all that crap, but we're in control because we control the assets of the world. And DHHS in Atlanta, Georgia, holds the birth certificates for approximately 7 billion people. <coughs> Gosh, they took over the world without even firing a shot, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> What's that? 
They do meet regularly, four times this year, and then in July is when they pulled all the politicians of the world in last July and said, guess who's running things now? Yeah. You have to be. You're dealing with that jurisdiction, that corporate world. Hey, I'm sorry I screwed up. It's not C G I, it's C R I. All right. Okay, I'm going to make a little announcement for those that want to. About eight o'clock or so in the lobby next door, a bunch of people want to meet and greet. If you guys want to get to know each other, just interchange information. That's after you go to dinner or whatever, get fed, go over there and talk if you want. Uh, meet each other, exchange your information. Anything else you want? That's it, really, it's just a meet and greet. Yeah. Have fun at dinner. Where's my Belgium guys? <laughs> yep, we're done for today, how's that? See you tomorrow.